So we ask that you're mindful about what you share and what you put in the chat box. Materials for this meeting were distributed um, by Gov Delivery last week, and we'll also make those available on the LCB Law and Rules website at www.lcb.wa.gov forward slash law and rules. So during today's meeting, we do have an hour set aside for attendees to pose questions to our panel. If you wish to pose a question to the panel, please use the chat box to sign up. And remember, questions are limited to consumer experience around cannabis quality. Staff will monitor the chat box and take your name down. For those who joined us by telephone only, you can email your questions to rules, that's lowercase r, so R-U-L-E-S at lcb.wa.gov. The LCB values all voices and we strive to create opportunities for all to share their thoughts throughout the session today. It's important for us that this is a collaborative process. And while we do need to be mindful of the agenda, we hope that this first deliberative dialogue session will encourage all of us to freely listen, think, and explore new ideas together. So as the session moves through the agenda, you can provide comment and questions in the chat box and staff will review those. But we ask that you don't use the chat box for anything that could be construed as bullying or harassing. I do want to draw your attention to the mute and unmute buttons. And I think everybody should see those on their screen. Panelists and others, please remember to keep yourself on mute when you aren't speaking. When you do wish to speak, please make sure that you are unmuted. You'll also note the video icon, and we ask that to the extent possible, panel members use the video icon because it really does help with engagement so that folks can see you when you're speaking. For other participants, we ask that you keep your cameras off until you've been called on to speak. And I just wanted to briefly pull up the agenda one more time. Um, I hope that everyone's had an opportunity to see this. We're in this section here. Um, I'm going to share a little bit on the slide deck on some of these other points. Um, but we're hoping to get into the panel discussion in full or introduction at least by um, about 10 minutes to um, two, if not a little bit earlier. I'm going to pull that down from the screen now and move into the slide deck. Uh, excuse me here. All right, so our overall meeting goal today is to build an understanding of consumer perspectives related to cannabis product testing. And our dialogue intentions today are to provide consumers a platform to share and discuss their unique perspectives related to cannabis product testing. Increase opportunity for genuine, respectful, and moderated dialogue between all participants and identify consumer themes that may be used to inform cannabis product quality testing rules um, and future rule and policy development. And why are we here? LCB has been uh, considering revising cannabis product testing rules for quite some time now. Two public hearings have been held on cannabis product testing rules so far. So the first was in July 2020. I'd like to ask um, that everyone go on mute, please. Um, first was held on July of 2020 and the second was in November of 2020. And after considering all written and oral testimony, the board and the agency would like to better understand the perspectives of the full authorizing environment. How is the data going to be collected, shared, and presented to decision makers today? Well, the comments received will be added to an Excel workbook. This is typically what we do with listen and learn sessions. Then they'll be organized by theme and analyzed. Comments will be presented to the board for review and discussion. 
and then the LCB will share recordings and comment tables externally. And I just wanted to double check and take a pause here. Um, I don't think I am in the host uh, position in this uh, session right now. I wanted to check with Audrey and Casey. We are recording this session, correct? Correct, it's currently recording. Thank you, I just wanted to confirm before I moved on. Thanks very much. So moving into meeting protocol, there's really three participant roles today. So we have our panelists of five um, volunteers who've offered to share their perspectives today from a consumer perspective. There's myself as the moderator, um, and then there is the role of the participant and listener. As the moderator, I'm really just going to be posing the first initial set of questions to our panelists, and they'll each be answering those questions and then speaking amongst themselves, interacting with respect to those questions. And then in my role as a moderator for um, participant and listeners, I'll be posing the questions to our panelists. They can uh, answer the question individually and then speak among themselves. And then I'll be following up with questions and the participants the participant and listeners can also follow up with questions, but we'll do that on an individual basis. And we just ask that you bear with us as we um, sort of test this new model. We've never tried this before, so um, hoping that everyone can give us a little bit of grace as we um, uh, move forward in this new space. So moving into what deliberative dialogue is, I found a really good explanation on resolutioncollaborative.com that I wanted to share with everyone today. And I'm going to read this for folks who might be on the telephone and may not be in front of a screen. Deliberative dialogue differs from other forms of public disclosure, such as debate, negotiation, brainstorming, or consensus building because the objective is not so much to talk together as to think together, not so much to reach a conclusion as to discover where a conclusion might lie. Thinking together involves listening deeply to other points of view, exploring new ideas and perspectives, searching for points of agreement, and bringing unexamined assumptions into the open. And so I won't read this comparison table because this is something that we shared in sort of our, our guidance document around deliberative dialogue. But there is a distinction between deliberative dialogue and debate. And we're asking all participants today to um, honor the tenets of deliberative dialogue around collaboration and finding common ground listening to and finding meaning and other things. So our engagement our protocol for today, in other words, what are the ground rules for deliberative dialogue? So again, our purpose is to understand and learn from one another. So this isn't a, a situation where we're trying to win a debate because it isn't a debate. We're really seeking points of diversion. Uh, we're, not, we're not looking for finding points of diversion or finding flaws. And we're not looking for a right answer. What we're really looking for is common ground. We're asking that all participants speak for themselves. Um, in our dialogue, everyone here is equal. Um, really hoping that we can leave our differences um, behind the door. Ask that everyone be open and listen to each other, um, especially when we disagree. And we really ask that folks identify and test assumptions, even your own assumptions. We ask that folks listen carefully and respectfully, respectfully, excuse me, to the views of other, everyone here. Acknowledge that you've heard the other, especially when you disagree. And again, we really are looking for common ground here and being respectful of all points of view. And again, I will work my best to objectively guide the discussion today. 
And just a reminder, once again, since this is a public work session, anything shared has the potential to become part of a public record. All right, so our protocol for today, um, I will, uh, will allow the panelists, I'll introduce the panelists and then each will take about five minutes to introduce themselves. Then we'll begin the first half of moderated panel discussion and dialogue. And this is the section where participants will listen to the discussion. And then the second half will be moderated participant questions and panel responses. You can use the hand raise feature to indicate you have a question and we'll call on you in the order received. Also, I recognize that we don't have a break built into the agenda, so feel free to come and go as uh, you see fit. And so we'll start by um, identifying who, you're, who is here. We're looking forward to um, uh, meeting you. So if you would, if you could put your name in the chat box, um, uh, share who you are affiliated with or represent, if you feel comfortable sharing that. And then let us know why you're interested in this topic. We'll give a couple minutes for that. And then I would like to begin with panelist introductions. And on our agenda today, we have John Kingsbury, Megan White, Court Lever, and Megan, I hope I said your name correctly, Michael Smith, Nancy Southern, and Roshana Lind. So, John, would you like to start with uh, five minutes of introduction, please? Okay. Uh, so, my name is John Kingsbury, and um, I have a written statement. Uh, my name is John Kingsbury. I've been a medical cannabis patient since 2009. Prior to that, my use of cannabis was infrequent. Uh, before I provide specific questions for quality assurance, I need to provide a few general comments. I'm giving my input today as a patient. I need to be clear that patient consumption varies from patient to patient, but more importantly, patients, patient use is distinctly different from recreational use. Recreational users have different needs from medical users, and so they cannot speak for medical users. The, the idea of a one voice labeled consumers is absurd and cannot work. If you've ever said all use is medical or said the difference between medical use and recreational use is not the products, but the intent of the user, then you fundamentally misunderstand the patient experience and our needs. If you are not a patient under the treatment of a physician, then I ask that you not say such things. Uh, the words cannabis consumer are risky to use because it might mislead people that recreational use and medical use are similar. I am here today because um, after five years of really no real metal, medical access, I must deal with the reality that there is no medical system and that LCB has been clear and consistent in its view that it is fine with the absence of appropriate medical access. My annual survey showed that 49% of patients are accessing outside of the regulated system. On top, one of the top reasons patients say that they avoid regulated product is because of the fear of contamination. Sampling of regulated and unregulated product shows that this concern is well-founded and that cleaner access can currently be found outside of the regulated market. We need to change that. This confluence of conditions means that patients have been recriminalized. This is cruel and unnecessary. Uh, there is no medical system in the state, so making this work, this process today, is our biggest only chance to make that work. What we're doing here today is crucially important because of the recre because if the recreational system does not set a floor standard for a product that meets the needs of patients, then patients will never have regulated access. This process that we're engaged in now is that important. 
Towards creating solutions, I am suggesting the minimum requirements towards creating a quality assurance floor for medical consumers requirements within the recreational system. These are not negotiating points. These are what I believe the floor is. For most patients, the use of neem and neem derivatives such as Azimax are a deal breaker. I suggest a mandatory label on products that includes, include the use of neem derivatives. Uh, these are not necessarily safe. Um, my suggestion would inform the consumer and let the consumer decide. We need a limit on total molds. High mold levels are making patients sick. I can tell you how I got to that statement. Most states have a limit on total molds of 10,000 colony forming units or CFUs. The product I'm holding up was tested at 170,000 CFUs and yet it meets Washington State's testing requirements. That's unhealthy and it's disgusting. We need to do better. Perhaps we do not need to limit total molds to 10,000 CFUs, but 50 or 60,000 is certainly not too restrictive. Many consumers and store staff are confused that the word organic means no pesticides. We need to find a way to educate store staff and consumers to the fact of what organic means in terms of pesticides. Pyrethrins and similar agents have action limits for concentrates. It makes no sense that there would not be an action limit for flour as well. These are very potent agents. Product pesticide information must be easily accessible within the store. Getting that information should not be like pulling teeth. Remediation of product that fails testing does not seem unreasonable so long as remediated product is well tested again. All concentrates must be tested at the end product and for each batch. If we're going to serve qualified patients in the regulated system, we should meet these standards within the regulated system or not pretend that we're meeting the needs of people like me. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, um, next I'd like to introduce um, Megan. So, Megan, uh, can you provide us with a five minute introduction, please? Um, I absolutely can. And I think John covered a whole lot of what I am also looking to address. I am a consumer, both medically and recreationally, so I have both perspectives. And um, am surrounded by by people who have been involved in this industry, especially the medicinal side since 1998 um, from every aspect. I mean, we've done it all. And um, I agree, there needs to be better regulations, better access, better information, a better setup for medicinal patients. I feel that since 502, um, was voted in and we removed the dispensaries, we lost a lot of patient care and a lot of trust. And I also have come across um, a majority of medicinal patients who are absolutely accessing outside of the regulated market because they don't feel their needs are being met. They don't feel the products are safe. Um, they don't feel heard and they don't feel like they're getting appropriate advice or direction as far as their medicinal needs are concerned. And I'm also incredibly concerned about the mold problem, um, concerned about concentrates and how many parts per million of residual solvent are allowed to be left, um, how much powdery mildew is out in the market, both medicinally and recreationally. Um, but primary concern is definitely the medical. I know that the way that the system has been set up has depleted a lot of the resources that the dispensaries were able to offer, such as donating to patients in need. That's not really an option anymore. Um, and they do need more information about exactly how the products are made, um, how concentrates are extracted, you know, the fact that ethanol is used and isopropyl alcohol is used. All those things are a major concern for me. And another thing I've noticed from medical patients that they have 
told me is they're not comfortable with the registration system in any way, shape, or form. Um, because it's still federally illegal, many people, especially in an older generation, feel that they are signing a document that states they're breaking federal law and that they should not have to do that in order to access appropriate medicine. So those are the reasons I'm here and I'm hoping to be a positive part of this discussion and bring something to the table and hope we come to solutions. And that's me. <laughs> Great, thank you very much, Megan. We're glad you're here. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Michael Smith. Michael, would you like to uh, introduce yourself and, and take five minutes to do so? Hi, everybody. <clears throat> so uh, a little background on my, my history with the cannabis industry. Uh, I became part of the, uh, the industry proper in 2013 when I moved to Oregon to open a dispensary down there. And I've been involved with the industry ever since. I currently run a store here in Washington. It's tribally owned by the Jamestown Sklalem tribe. It's called Cedar Greens. Uh, let's see here. So first, a personal note, I am, I am not a capitalist. I'm a little bit anti-capitalist. That being said, uh, running a business, I always have my eye on the bottom line. Um, and today, what I see us talking about is that we're addressing a problem. Uh, the problem can be framed a few different ways, depending on who's, who's talking about it. The way I frame it is that our state is far behind where it should be on the uh, cannabis lab testing that should be required for consumers to feel safe purchasing cannabis from state regulated stores. Uh, a little history on the Oregon market. Uh, when legalization first took place in Oregon, the uh, Oregon Health Authority was at first regulating all the cannabis testing down there. And <clears throat> at a certain point, um, labs started kind of uh, calling each other out and doing forensic testing on each other. They would go take products off of shelves tested by other labs, retest that product, and then publish uh, failed results from product that had been cleared by another lab. All of that eventually led to uh, reform within the testing of the Oregon market there. And um, as authority was handed over from the Oregon Health Authority to the Oregon Liquor Control Commission, uh, it brought in lab oversight from Oralab, which is basically the organization that regulates all of the lab testing for uh, different things like water testing, soil testing, you name it in Oregon, they accredit the labs. So uh, at that time, I was running a store down there and I suddenly saw somewhere upwards of 80% of what had currently been available from wholesale vendors disappear from the market. Suddenly we were seeing failed test results left and right. Most of those failures were for a chemical called microbutanol, which has a trade name Eagle 20. It's something that growers spray on their cannabis here in the Northwest to control for powdery mildew. And it is probably the most commonly used pesticide that will that uh, growers will otherwise not admit that they are growing, uh, that they are not uh, not admit that they are using on their products. Uh, at that time, there was one grower who I had a very strong personal relationship with. This grower had started growing medical cannabis for his father, who was extremely ill, and he was uh, supplying our store with small batches of high, high quality cannabis. Uh, he believed that his product was testing clean. Uh, of microbutanol at that time. When the oral app oversight came into play, suddenly his product showed a 300 time over the limit uh, test for microbutanol. It was almost as much a surprise to him as it was to us, except he knew he was using that product. Uh, I'll go ahead and wrap up my five minutes at this point and let, let these come back, but I'll say this, who you trust is very key here. 
we are putting our trust in growers, we are putting our trust in labs, we are putting our trust in the state of Washington to regulate the process. All of this needs to be addressed. Great, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Nancy Southern. Nancy, uh, if you'd like to take five minutes to introduce yourself, please do. Good afternoon, hello. Uh, I'm newer to the cannabis world from some of our other speakers today. Uh, I was having health challenges in 2015, 2016, and most everything I was trying uh, in my for or preferred form of healthcare, which is the more naturalistic route, uh, I was just not getting to the level of wellness that I was seeking. And a friend suggested that I watch a, an online documentary series called The Sacred Plant. And so I watched a couple episodes and it was all about the medical use of cannabis. And I just knew I had to give it a try, especially living in Washington where it was legal and I could, could access it almost immediately. Uh, and I noticed enough of a change pretty much from the beginning, even though I took more than I have ever needed since then. I, 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 I can't call it an overdose, but I did have too much and I was uncomfortable for a couple of hours. But I learned something about myself in that process that said this could help me regain some of my sense of natural health and, and well-being, which was my goal. Uh, so I knew I needed to learn as much as I possibly could. And having been an adult educator most of my life, I also realized that uh, my fellow baby boomers were definitely going to be wanting to know more about this. So I made a personal commitment to myself that I was going to learn as much as I possibly could, along with uh, doing my own uh, experimentation as a non-medical user. So it was interesting to be approaching cannabis from a health and wellness standpoint in order to improve my health, uh, rather than trying to um, overcome a specific illness, which is the de delineation that uh, is represented by the uh, medical uh, qualifications to be a medical patient. So I did not go that route. Uh, and the same concerns that all the other panels so far that have talked about uh, safety and uh, purity of product and accuracy of what the product actually includes, uh, whether it's straight cannabis or other additives have been uh, entered in, make a huge difference for me. And the processing method makes a huge difference for me. Before I understand that stood all the different ways of extraction, uh, I tried a product once that I didn't realize had been butane processed, and I had a very severe Ab reaction uh, to that particular product. So, you know, my red flags went off saying, oh, I have to pay much more uh, close attention to labeling and processing and um, also learn more about the ratio issue. Uh, because uh, for myself and most of my uh, community of the over 55 group, uh, it's not that we're, we never want to get high, but we don't want that to be the objective of consuming. We're looking for relief from all different types of discomfort, uh, whether of mind, body, or spirit. And so uh, becoming an educator was really important for me to understanding how to use it properly and how to read labels. So I was fortunate enough to get an opportunity to work in a dispensary that was very health and medical oriented. And it gave me an opportunity to begin to bridge the gap between the actual products and what I was learning in the educational world as to how cannabis can be used for all different types of various uh, health symptoms. And so that's what I've been doing since um, mid middle of 2017. And I made a commitment to learn something new about cannabis every day, and that continues to be true. I happen to be fortunate, I'm a microdoser. It doesn't take much cannabis for me to find my point of homeostasis, which is the whole point of, of, I think, the cannabis plant being an adaptogenic botanical plant. Uh, it's designed to help the body come back into balance. And yes, it can be very specifically used for certain conditions. And I, I really honor that and respect that. Uh, so labeling is really important to me. Uh, purity, uh, accuracy of labeling is important. And I look for pretty pure cannabis products. I don't want things that have a lot of other additives because 
because of my high sensitivity, I'm never sure that that other little thing that they decide to add in because they thought it might smell better or taste better um, would be nice to have in there. And oftentimes that's the one thing that my body would react to. Uh, I'm primarily a non-smoker. Once in a while, I will vape a flower that I have found from a very reputable grower, but oftentimes there's still way more THC in those than uh, I'm looking for, unless I am particularly looking for a, a mental or emotional uh, support, like for sleeping or just anxiety relief. So that's my story. I teach mostly seniors in webinars and private consultations, and uh, most people don't understand how cannabis works and why it works. And so that's my objective uh, to support good labeling, clear labeling, readable labeling, uh, with or without your glasses, uh, and uh, valid testing. That's really important to me. And th that's the hardest part to come by as an over-the-counter consumer is really understanding what processes and what's gone into both the growing of the plant itself and the process that led it to, say, the tincture or the topical or the transdermal or whatever other form it takes, because each of those steps away from the plant can change the effectiveness of the cannabinoids and or terpenes that was in the original plant. So I think that'll be enough for now and I'll add more later if appropriate. Great, thank you very much for joining us today, Nancy. And then finally, uh, Shauna Wynn, welcome. Um, uh, five minutes of introduction for you. Hi, everybody. Thank you. I'm, I'm really glad to be here and contribute. My name, uh, again, is Shauna Wind. I am a medical patient. Um, I, I use, I'm a one-to-one -one advocate. I use 100 milligrams of THC CBD one-to-one. -one. I do 50-50 in the morning and 50-50 in the afternoon. Um, I'm also a grower because I, I have a medical, I'm a medical card holder and I am a grower and I make my own um, edibles and tinctures because there's not a lot available for medical users as has been repeated several here as a medical patient um, that is a problem for me is not getting uh, the right amount of dosage because there's not a lot of uh, the, the, the dosage is too low for me. Um, I'm also a med medical marijuana consultant and um, I am a speaker at the Seattle Central College for the chemical dependency counseling class. And I was excited to share with that class the benefits of CBD. And I was really surprised at how many people going into chemical dependency did not still see uh, cannabis as a drug and didn't see it, how it could actually be helpful, um, including studies that showed um, in laboratory rats um, when they were on CBD and their drug was prepped in front of them, the heart rate off CBD versus on CBD was a big significant difference, showing that while on CBD, their heart rate does not go up, meaning that people who are in recovery, this could be added to their regimen to help them sustain um, balance. I love that word balance. Um, I've been using cannabis for over 20 plus years, and um, I moved to Washington for medical cannabis. I love that there are um, different rules for the medical patients and for um, consumers, meaning that I am allowed to grow and I am allowed to purchase larger amounts so I don't have to go as often since I need to consume more. Um, I think that's fantastic. I do, uh, I will be bringing up later and what I do wish is uh, that there were, I guess, more options for medical users. I do like clean green product. It's very difficult to find clean green product and I wondered with all the money coming in and all the revenue, if there could be some sort of um, benefit given to growers that they don't have to pay out of pocket to have that certification. People who do grow safely with in compliance, but don't necessarily have to pay to have that attachment. Maybe there could be something like, hey, if you're a clean green grower, we'll send it out, get that certified. This way, medical patients uh, have a lot more uh, trans you know, transparency to people who are doing uh, clean green growing. Um, I do like that medical patients are registered. Um, I think that there's an ability here to do deliveries. 25 states are doing deliveries. There's a lot of patients who are really ill and cannot go into dispensaries. 
it is a lot of friends are having to do runarounds and it's just really difficult. Um, 25 states can do deliveries. I know Washington can because we are pioneers. And I think that using the registration card could be a great way because you could just scan the back of it when you do deliveries. I have alcohol delivered to my house and the Amazon person scans my ID to give me booze, which is fatal. Cannabis is not fatal. And I think it should be delivered to patients. And, and I really hope that we can find solutions to that. So um, I also am concerned because uh, about the packaging. This is another thing uh, with uh, all the cannabinoids and terpenes that a medical patient can smell it and know what is really beneficial to their body. The nose tells you more than anything. And um, the, the waste with the Mylar bags is just breaks my heart that thousands and thousands of non-biodegradable, non-recyclable plastic Mylar bags are thrown away in this green state of Washington. And I, and I just hope that we could figure out a better solution considering that the flower plant itself is non-toxic, non-fatal and non-psychoactive. If someone actually ate the green flower, nothing would happen except for maybe some great health benefits. So I don't think it needs to be so restricted. And maybe that's the difference between the consumer and the medical patient. We need to have some sort of uh, different rules or boundaries or something like that, because I feel like medical patients need have different needs and they're not being really met. Um, and and the, the milligrams, you know, getting 10 milligrams of dosage for edibles is is just not feasible for medical patients, especially ones who have serious illnesses and, and terminal illnesses, um, high pain illnesses, they need up to 500 milligrams. And um, I just feel like they're being left behind and um, and nobody wants to eat 50 pieces of candy. So I just wish that there was like some better ways that we could we can do that. So that's what I'm here for. I, I'm, I'm clean green. I want to smell some cannabis. I want delivery. I want more availability for medical patients. And thank you all. Oh, and you know what? I do, Nancy, those glasses, I had to get bifocals to read the back of that packaging. It would be really great if uh, labels were a little bit more easy to read. Great, thank you very much, Shauna. Again, welcome panelists. Um, I wanna take a moment here and recognize that we also have um, one of our board members joining us today, and that's board member um, Russ Hauge. Um, board member Halgi, do you wish to make a statement or just say hello? Well, I don't know. Oh, go ahead. There I'm sorry. Go. Just uh, let me say hello. Uh, I've uh, been following uh, the work on this initiative uh, more closely in the last several months than I have uh, for as long as it's been going on. And uh, I hope that we will be able to, as a result of this panel and others, uh, chart a course forward because we've been in the same place for a long time. Uh, as uh, Mr. Kingsbury points out, uh, we're facing the same issues. Uh, a lot of them are not within the scope of our rulemaking authority, but let's try to find out what we can do and make it happen. Uh, that's my intention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Board Member Halby. All right, so with that, we are running a little bit ahead of time, but um, I think we'll go ahead and dive into the first three questions. And for some reason, the slides are not advancing, so bear with me here, <laughs> sorry. All right. So just as a side note, I guess, so everyone understands where these questions came from. I don't know if you all remember that when we were recruiting for these panels, we asked um, applicants to pose three, four, and sometimes more questions. Some, some folks provided us with many questions that you might want to ask the particular panel that you are applying for or another panel that we may be offering. And so we looked through many of those questions, all of those questions, and um, selected um, six for this particular panel. There will be six for the next panel and six for the final panel representing labs. Um, but these are questions that came from you. 
So these are not curated or created by LCB. So just want to start with that in mind. And so again, just as a reminder on the format panel, if you wish to turn on your cameras now, um, let's see if we can get everyone on camera while you're having this discussion. Um, but um, I'll go ahead and post the first question. And if we can start with John, then we'll go to Megan, then to Michael, then to Nancy, then to Shauna. And then um, if you'd like to discuss, you know, with each other in the course of that, that's fine to do. So I want to try turning on your video cameras now, panel members. So you would like me to speak? No, if you could turn on your camera, if we could get all the panel members to turn on their um, video, can you click on your video icon at the same time? There you go, there's John. Let's see, Shauna, can you, uh, Megan, can you turn on your camera as well? Uh, Michael? As far as I can tell, my camera is on. This yeah. is Megan. Everybody on? All right. All right, so um, I'll go ahead and pose the first question for folks who are on the phone and can't see it on the screen. The first question was, is when you purchase a product, how do you determine whether a product is safe enough for you to use? How do you shop? And what exactly do you look for as a customer? And we'll start with John. Okay, so the first thing I look for is this label here, which is the DOH compliant label. And so from that, I know specifically what the testing standards are, and I know um, that it in fact has been tested. Uh, the previous speaker mentioned Clean Green Certified, which is something I hear from, from store personnel a lot. Nobody knows what that means. I've asked Department of Agriculture what that means. I've asked Clean Green Certified what that means. I've asked clerks who say, here, try Clean Green Certified, and they never know what it means. But with that DOH certified label, we know what it means. So I look, so I either buy with that label or I buy um, if I know the producer themselves and I know personally what their practices are. So I tend to be very brand centered in that way. Um, I buy the great majority of my product from the unregulated market simply because of the difficulty of getting information and appropriate product in the regulated market. I don't like to do that. That's not my preference, but I feel like I've sort of been uh, pushed to do that. What I tend to look for is a ratio of THC to CBD that's roughly in the same neighborhood or roughly in the one-to-one -one, uh, ratio. Um, really, that's what I look for. Um, I don't really look for strength so much because Nobody doses that closely. Nobody measures their doses out, um, you know, to the degree of 15% or whatever. So that's uh, that's how I look for it. I, I look for testing and I look for CBD to THC ratios, so. Great, hey, hey John. I have a follow-up question for you really quickly. Do you feel like the, when you're looking for testing, does that, that, it sounds like that DOH label sort of says to you that that product is safe for you to use. Is there anything else with regard to safety assurances that you're looking for? Is there anything else that would increase your confidence in that product? Besides testing? Besides the DOH compliant product. So th the thing is that we have standards for recreational product, but actual testing seems to be pretty scant. So even though there is a standard there, we don't know that it's been tested. There's also a lot of confusion among clerks. If I say I want something that's pesticide free, which is something I will ask for if I go into a 502 store, the clerks go, oh, well, this is organic. So they're confused about what that means, or this is clean green certified. And that tells me that they don't necessarily understand the product themselves. And I often get that kind of information from uh, the uh, medical consultants. So they seem very confused. Um, so um, there are other things. 
Uh, I look for um, things that you might look for in a wine. For instance, if I know that it meets my safety standards, you know, I like certain strains. I will look for, um, I like a little bit of more of an energetic um, cannabis. Um, so there are certain strains that I will look for, I guess. Is that, is that go to your question or are you talking more yeah. about safety? I was talking more about safety, but if you want to stand on strains, you're welcome to. Right. So, um, I, my use is medical. And, and so some things aggravate my neurological condition and some things really help them. Um, there's not a good way to get help on that other than experience and talking to other people. It's not a great way to get medicine, but I do find that if I go towards these strains, I get help. Whereas if I go to other things, maybe I don't. So I do seek those out as well as just sort of the quality for, for instance, some growers, um, they flush their products very, very well. And, and so I'll always prefer that and some growers, not so much. But again, that's sort of like shopping for wine in a way. You sort of become familiar with, you know, what's this grape and what's this production practice. And that's that's a sort of a less tangible form of quality control, I guess. But really, I want to know that that product's been tested and I want to know what those what those standards are. And if somebody claims something's pesticide free, I want some evidence of that other than the clerk telling me that. So. Great. Thank you very much, John. Mm -hmm. so, uh, same question for Megan. Um, sure. Actually, let's see here. There's a couple of things. Um, I used to look at the labels, and when I did, I was looking for harvest date. I wanted to know how long it had been sitting in the package or how fresh it was whether or not it could possibly have had the chance to cure, which actually really does matter in quality of cannabis. Um, the reason I stopped reading labels is, as I said, when I applied for this panel, um, I'm surrounded by people in the industry, every aspect from seed to sale. And our passion is in medicinal, of course, but so I know growers, um, I know gardeners, I know processors, I, I know several in each aspect. And what I have learned, which is really sad and unfortunate, is um, at least more than one grower I personally know of does not place accurate labels on the product the label says is that product. So for example, they get an order for Dutch treat and they don't have enough of it to fill the order. So they'll just fill it with whatever they have and label it as Dutch treat. So then you have a product whose label doesn't even match. So even if the testing has been done, even if all the numbers are accurate, we don't have any way to prove that it's on the accurate product, which is really frustrating. And um, so what, and, you know, as John mentioned, for my medicinal use, I've had to rely almost completely on the unregulated market because what works for me for my medicinal uses is, is FICO, or some people know it as RSO, the full extract cannabis. Um, and to get a full spectrum medication, you have to use more than one strain. And our current market does not allow for concentrates to be made with more than one strain. So even when I consult with people who are interested in trying it medically, which I encounter a lot of people um, who wish they were more comfortable, wish that the stores were more knowledgeable in helping them find the right thing. Um, but unfortunately, I don't even feel like I can send them to the rec stores because there's not a product there that I feel is good enough for them um, because you can't get a full spectrum medicine from only one strain. Each cannabis strain has different cannabinoids and 
There are hundreds of them that we know of so far. And we only discuss two, THC and CBD. But there is, it's like a, I describe it to people like a bag of jelly bellies, variety jelly bellies. Well, so we discuss vanilla and chocolate. What about all the other flavors and how they matter and how each strain has different combinations and the absolute best medicine I've ever had has involved multiple strains, no less than five good strains. And so what I do now, if I do go to the rec stores, you're gonna laugh, but I bring with me a jeweler's loop that also includes a black light because black light detects mold. And the amount of mold and mildew that I have personally purchased from the rec stores blows my mind. And the amount of growers that are only sending in the least moldy sample so that it will pass regulation and then send out the rest of the lot as if it qualifies just the same is mortifying. And I can't recommend to people that they go there when I know these things because I can see them. And it's funny, the rec store employees often, uh, I'll ask them if it's okay, if I look at it with my jeweler's loop and they all look at me a little different, but every one of them has said, feel free. And then they want to see what I see. They want to see what I'm looking for. I can't tell you how many um, bud tenders I have helped educate who have really appreciated what I've had to share and the questions that I ask. And there is only one question that I ask other than looking at looking at it through the jeweler's loop for the things I know to look for because I have the knowledge. Um, and it is, I would like to know what product the same person returned to your store for before it was gone. I want to know what they were so impressed with, they came back for it to make sure that they got more of it before it was gone. That's what I ask. That's what that's the only way I've ever gotten quality product out of a rec store. So that's that's how I felt. <laughs> I'm not sure what else to say. I was on mute myself. I was saying, okay, Michael. Uh, oh, okay, Michael, okay, gotcha. Apologies. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So, and and I think there's going to be lots of opportunity for us to kind of uh, bring up the same subject matter over and over through these mm -hmm. questions as there's some crossover, but I'm going to try to keep it a little bit specific so we stay on point. Um, the panel, as I see it, is mainly meant to address the pesticide, uh, the increased pesticide testing that is possibly coming up, but uh, in the bigger question of what I would use to determine what whether a product is safe for me to use, I, I'm going to put this out there. I, I want I want you guys to ask yourselves if you are considering all of the safety variables when you purchase product. Have you considered whether that packaging was clean before the product was put into that packaging? Have you considered whether or not the laboratory that said that product was safe is delivering you accurate lab results. Have you considered, um, if you're considering waste, you, we are concerned about mylar, but are you con considering the fact that caps on glass jars are not recyclable and by weight might create more waste than mylar does itself? These are all considerations. I don't think that they're easy answers to the questions that arise from these considerations. But uh, for me, when I'm considering safety, I think that uh, John and Megan both brought up some good points about knowing the, the brand. Um, John raised Washington Bud Company there, which in the past has adhered to certain Department of Health uh, standards. Although if you go to their website, they're not currently following them the way they used to because of the, uh, because of the heavy metal testing standards that are currently in place. Uh, we, we could also talk about uh, labs and whether we trust labs, uh, cannab cannabinoid ratios and all of that. Pixis Laboratories, many of you might have heard, 
was just shut down for falsifying over 1,200 1200 lab reports and then for trying to destroy evidence of the falsified lab reports during the investigation. Um, many people have been putting their, their trust in those reports. So that's something to consider. Uh, clean green certification. I, I know people who do clean green certification and uh, some of them are very thorough in the process where they inspect and educate um, during a farm visit or a site visit. Others show up and smoke a joint with the farmers and say, here's your paperwork, you're good. Um, that's, a, that's a private certification, but we could also talk about USDA organic certification and what kind of trust you put into that process. Who runs that process? Is it one individual or is it a bunch of individuals who are held to a certain standard? Um, I would just invite all of you to try to keep your focus as broad as possible when considering safety and, and what might be affecting the product you purchase, because it's not just going to be one thing. It's not just that particular store, that particular vendor, the lab that tested for that vendor. Um, so many factors go in. But considering that this is a conversation about, or should be about pesticides, at least, again, based on why I joined the panel, um, I just want you guys all to think about this. If we're considering variables, the number of variables that could affect your safety. In Oregon, at the time that Oralap began oversight of laboratory testing, in 2016, the state required of all products, not just medical products, but of all products, they required testing for 59 different compounds. Here in our state, that testing is not required unless the DOH label is being sought. And when that testing is performed, they test for 13 pesticides. So I would put forth the, uh, the idea that we are way behind in our laboratory testing. And if you're reading a label and using that to give you some faith in the product you're purchasing, you might be fooling yourself. Thank you very much, Michael. Nancy. Uh, I'm going to just switch the focus a little bit because of uh, my personal story, but also because of the age group that I represent as uh, older adults. Um, most of them, if they're coming to cannabis for the first time, like I did, well, I knew about cannabis when I was in my 20s and 30s, uh, but had gotten totally away from it because I just couldn't control what I was getting even back then and I was sensitive then so it, it wasn't that I thought it was a terrible thing it just didn't work for me in the way that I had hoped so fast forward to this previous decade 2017 when I started looking uh, I wasn't looking to smoke anything I just didn't think that that would be the best method and most everything was very high in THC so I was looking for a more balanced product um, the recommendations that I was uh, learning about and had heard from more educated uh, sales folks uh, who had been in the medical market before uh, things went recreational or adult use permissive um, was a more balance. Uh, I believe uh, that um, Shauna mentioned that too about a one-to-one. A one-to-one -one. One -one can work for me. A two-to-one can work for me. Sometimes I want a 20-to-one. My needs vary. Uh, and so most of the time I'm looking at uh, tinctures, but more importantly, concentrated oil extracts. Uh, I had a wonderful experience with an RSO uh, from a reputable grower. I trusted what they were doing. It was uh, very natural. They weren't, uh, you know, adding a whole lot of other uh, unhealthy things to it. And I, I had a good experience. But even that in the ratio that I felt my body was needing was too strong. So I learned to make my own diluted tinctures by taking an RSO and diluting it into a carrier oil like avocado oil. And uh, that way I could dose myself much more easily um, in, in the microdosing that, that worked well for me. So for me, it was about simplicity of product, not a lot of additives. There are some wonderful tinctures out there that sell well, but if they have a lot of added terpenes or other 
uh, herbal additives to it in addition to the cannabis, oftentimes those can be problematic for me. So uh, I'm looking for something that is as close to the original plant as possible uh, with the compatible ratios of one to one or a slightly higher CBD than THC. And then I can determine how much is useful for me. And I find that when I'm talking to my friends and neighbors about this or senior groups that I uh, do webinars for, they don't really even understand how, how the, it works. Why does cannabis work for so many different conditions? And so the labeling can be even more confusing, uh, particularly because we can't talk about certain um, symptoms or diseases or anything like that because there's competition with the medical you know, diagnoses and stuff. I understand the importance of that, but if someone is needing pain relief or help with sleep or uh, neuropathic pain, uh, most people know what their body is doing. And so they can't even ask and get the kind of answers that they would hope to because there's a gap primarily in education. And so I don't know how in this context uh, where we're talking mainly about safety, but a good part of where people ended up having unhappy experiences with cannabis is they're simply undereducated and don't know how to shop to find the products that are safest. So I recommend doing a lot of personal research on certain companies. If they're looking at tinctures, look into the companies, find out what they're doing, how they're doing it, what their testing procedures are, and making sure that uh, you start low and go slow with anything that you're going to experiment with because everyone is different. Everyone's personal biological uh, needs are different and nobody can tell you what's gonna be best for you. But if you have knowledge, you have a better chance of making wiser decisions. So the more information we can give, not just to the consumer, but to the, the salespeople, uh, because they have to learn thousands of products in a well you know, stocked dispensary or, or shop, depending on what, what you call it. Uh, there are going to be hundreds of, of producers and processors, and each one of those may have, you know, anywhere from three to 10 or more products. So uh, it's unfair to the salespeople who uh, most of them just love cannabis and want to help other people feel good by using cannabis, whether it's for recreational purposes or for health and wellness. So uh, as much education as we can legitimately provide at the consumer level, uh, about safety and uh, how to determine what's going to be right for you, I think is really a, an important part of this conversation. Hey, this is Kat. I just have a, a quick follow up question for you on that to the education piece. Mm -hmm. I think hearing you say um, education about the type of product, how to use it, it, you know, go low, go slow to start with. In your opinion, would that education include? how to read a label to determine whether or not it's been tested or what to ask the retailer for, you know, in terms of, you know, can you give me the testing results for this particular product? Is that something that you think about adding to that educational? Um, yes, and, and the more, yeah, the more processed a cannabis product is, meaning the further away from the actual plant, that a tincture or an oil or a topical is from the source of that particular uh, uh, combination of cannabinoids, whether they've created an isolate or a combination of one or two, uh, that could be a real problem uh, because there's no way that they can give enough information for a tincture other than saying, you know, cannabis oil extract along with thus and so. It, it usually doesn't give you any information on where that cannabis oil came from and how it was um, extracted, grown, or uh, anything like that. So that there's a gap there. And I don't know how any label can have enough information to cover all of that, particularly sure. for the population, uh, which, and interestingly enough, the over 55 population is the fastest growing population on cannabis consumers. And so helping them find safe products is going to be more and more important because the older we get, the more vulnerable we are to toxicity. It's just plain and simple. We don't have as strong of resistance. And for people that already have health challenges, that is very uh, concerning. And so it's almost scarier 
you know, to go to just or feel safer to, to not try it when it might actually work because there just isn't enough information. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Maria. And finally, Shauna, what are your thoughts on this question? Oh, yeah, it was really wonderful to hear what everybody had to say. Um, for me, what I look for when I go uh, shopping um, for medical cannabis is a medical shop. Um, I find that the people in a medical shop are the ones who are educated and can give me better answers and are carrying products that have good labeling and are carrying products that are clean green. And to answer your question, what is clean green? I, with, I spoke with a clean green farmer at one of those medical dispensaries. And what he told me is that he has no uses, no pesticides, no synthetic fertilizer. He doesn't have to do flushing because he uses um, oyster shells. And also no toxic material can be anywhere on the property. Like not even a bottle of bleach can be in the bathroom where you take a, you know, you know use the bathroom, you know. So those are the things that I was told about clean green um, from a clean green certified grower. I, I do find it fascinating that and that you can't really control everything. There's so many ethics involved. There's some people who are going to really test well. And there's some people who are going to do this buddy system or cheat. And, and I think that needs to be regulated better. Um, but when you're having a for-profit system, some people work with ethics and values and some people's work for profit. And it's just depending on a person's motivation. I don't, I don't know how you regulate that, but it, it is a concern. So I, I do go to medical shops because they do more research. Um, the medical shop I go to, they even had a book that just had a list of all the uh, fertilizers that were used or um, pesticides that were used for every product they had. So if you asked each one, they, they had a list there and I thought that was great. But you go to these um, rec shops and I had a guy at a rec shop ask me if I wanted my receipt. And I was like, isn't that the law? <laughs> You know, and I think the reason why uh, a lot of them don't have that education is partly I think the delivery system would help because there's the if we didn't have to have so many people employed in these shops getting out this medicine, we wouldn't have to hire people on half fast turnover and bring in new people. I think that uh, you would have more quality, more educated employees if you if you could uh, just keep the dis dispensaries empty of the regulars. Like I have a regular order every week, just deliver it to me. I won't have to be in line taking up space kind of thing. Um, the, the, the things that work for me is I like being, having my medical card. Um, I like that it gets me a discount. I want quality products, but I, I do, you know, have a price point as a medical user. I, I have to consume a lot and that is a, a big issue for me. I, I wish that there, I didn't have to spend as much money on um, rec products. You know, if there was more medical products available, that would, that would be great. And yeah, so I guess that answers those three questions and so we can move on. Okay, thanks very much, Sean, I appreciate it. So before we move on to the next question, just wanna pose to the panel, any interaction, any response to each other? on any of your responses or questions that came up for you for each other before we move on to the next question. I do. Okay, John, go ahead. So Shauna brings up the registry, but we have a unique situation in the state um, that that um, the registry is a deal breaker for most states. So um, just statistically, Colorado has 90,000 patients in their registry and, and they, um, have pesticide testing in their recreational market. Washington State has maybe 9,000 patients in the registry. And we don't have a recreational market that substitutes for a medical market in this state. Um, and so the aversion to the registry in this state, when you attach the re registration to any initiative, numerically it's yeah um you're probably going it's a poison pill um and you know that's a complicated problem um there's ways to get at it but if we say if we do this for patients who are registered it's probably going to fail because we have this unique situation in this state like i said we have nine thousand patients colorado has ninety thousand. colorado has two million fewer people than we do um, uh, 
that's a complicated problem. The other thing too that Shauna talked about is the difference between recreational stores and medical stores. And we don't have that. I'm not sure how she's defining that, but that's not a distinction that we really make in this state. So I'm not sure how she's defining that. Um, there are stores that are medically certified and there are stores that are not. Um, if you are 18 years old and you have a medical card, you can only go into medical authorized stores. So some dispensaries are medically authorized and the ones that are do seem to offer more services towards patients. And you can look that up in which stores have medical authorization in your area. I think it's, it's um, I've, I've surveyed those and the knowledge base of those consultants is poor. Now, there are going to be individual stores that are good. Um, I would say the Novel Tree in Bellevue is an example. But because someone has a um, medical endorsement, um, it, they're not necessarily equipped to help you well. A lot of stores with medical endorsement to help you well. Right. There's so having there are, there's a lot of help out there too. There, having that endorsement isn't necessarily the key. A lot of endorsed stores feel like being a medical store means if you have a registration card, you get a 10% discount. And that's their total concept of what being a medical store is. And when you have a lot of confusion about, you know, what tests, I've talked to medical consultants that have no idea what testing standards for products are. Um, and so, that's sort of a different problem beyond quality assurance. That's more of an education problem and more of a commitment to having actual medical help. But I don't think you can really say that we have a medical system in the state. I think we have a few stores that are committed to that, but it's hard to identify them. And the way to identify them isn't necessarily a medical endorsement. And that makes getting help difficult. So, uh, it, it, let me give you an example. Um, Clean Green Certified, I know a grower that doesn't have to flush their plants. Well, flushing your plants doesn't has more to do with pesticides. Um, but I'm a grower. I, I, know, I, I flush my plants. I know about fertilizers. I mean, we may have differences in opinions. I don't want this to be an argument. Are you trying to convince me to, to think the way you do? I am sharing my opinion and I respect uh, yours. What, what I'm saying is there's no clear way to to identify where you're going to get help. And for so Nancy was talking about all the learning process. And, and, and that's true. That's just the reality of, of cannabis as medicine. But most people don't want to make cannabis that big of a part of their life. They want easier access to information. And we don't have anything close to that now. Now, the subject of this is quality assurance um, but if you don't know how to get access to that information that's not really helpful and, and so i think we need to be a realistic about the fact that we have no meaningful coherent medical system now we have a few stores with a few good people in them and i don't think that you can say that that's a medical system so I think we need to be realistic about what we have now in order to get to a system that does in fact work. So okay. that was my point. No, appreciate it. And Shauna, it sounded like you had a counterpoint to that. I just wanted to give some space for you to offer if you if you wanted to. I was invited to share my experience and my experience cannot be argued by anyone else. They can share their experience. And in my experience, I can go to medical stores and get more education, better products that suit me and better discounts than when I go to a rec store. And that is my experience. And I have a lot of it. And I'm grateful I can share it. Great. Thank you very much, Sean. I appreciate that. So it sounds like there are two different types of experiences with the medical uh, availability of medical product and medically endorsed um retail shop all right thank you thank you for those perspectives greatly appreciated before we move to the next question um just wanted to check in with the rest of the panel any any other thoughts before we move on i've been trying to raise my hand but i don't know if it if it actually oh, works or not <laughs> um 
but I I did want to say a, a couple of things. One, I'm reading as people who have joined us to watch this panel are trying to figure out what's going on, and they're very confused because we have been very focused on medical, and I, I realize that's a huge issue, and it uh, clearly affects all of us panelists. We all care very much about that part, um, but it is about product safety across the board, and so maybe just focusing on that because whether you're medicinal or recreational you still need a safe product we still need to figure out how to make sure what's being offered to everyone regardless of their need is a safe product and i've had hit and miss like i see both sides of what you guys are saying because i have come across um stores with a medical endorsement that were absolutely amazing and i loved them and they did know what they were talking about they did care and they paid attention to who they got their product from. They sampled stuff themselves. They gave an honest opinion. They didn't reorder from places that didn't meet their standard. And I've also come across medical endorsed stores that go, uh, yeah, maybe uh, try that. So there's definitely a variety. And going through the DOH list of who has a medical endorsement doesn't necessarily help you find the difference between the two. You just kind of have to brave it and see what happens. And I realized that a, a lot of people, especially, um, you know, anybody who's in an older generation and worried about their health and wanting to try this, you know, there's a comfort level that they don't have. But in general, we need to make sure that we have safe products. And in general, whether you're medical or recreational, I think it's incredibly important that concentrates are labeled with how they're made. How are they extracted? What was the extraction method? what solvent was used how did they verify that that residual that solvent didn't remain in the product to a level that could harm anyone i would love to see a much tighter standard on residual solvent allowed because as nancy mentioned even if so it was a butane extracted concentrate and even a tiny bit of residual butane caused a negative reaction well, my mother is one of my primary concerns and being anti-cannabis her entire life, she finally listened to her daughter and gave it a shot with nothing to lose. And it has changed her entire life. And, but she is the woman who like, if one person out of a million is going to have a bad reaction to something, but everybody else does just fine with it. My mom's that one. And she needs to know by looking at the label, how they created what they're calling medicine. And if it says something like butane or ethanol, that's concerning. So then I wanna know how did they make sure they removed that from the finished product? That's what matters to me, whether it's me medical or recreational. I personally, as a recreational user, won't touch any of the smokable concentrates because the level, like it, to me, it's like taking a poppy and changing it to heroin, there is a chemical process that happens there. So if we're going to do that, we absolutely need to make sure the end result is safe, no matter what your reasons for using. So that's what I wanted to put in there. And packaging, we got to do something different about the packaging because the amount of waste just blows my mind. And there has to be a better way. And I know so many growers who are mortified that we are putting stuff in plastic. Like a lot of growers will tell you that is the worst thing you can do to your cannabis is put it in plastic or expose it to light. I can't tell you how many UV lights I've seen in display counters in the store. And then they compare what's on the, on the counter behind them to what's been in the display case and it's brown and green. It matters. These things matter. So that's what I wanted to add. Okay, thank you, Megan. No problem. <laughs> All right, so we'll move on to the next question um, because we do want to end this discussion to stay on, on, on path on the agenda by 3.20. So we'll move through the next question just a, a little more rapidly, hopefully. So next question, um, as, and this comes from a craft cannabis operator. Um, who says, I'd like to know what is most important to the consumer. And you've 
many of you have shared this already, but this is a specific question. Is it price point or is it quality? Or where is the split between importance? So we'll go ahead and go through the same order that we did before. John, can you speak to that in about two or three minutes? I can't. So I think I can give a clear answer to this. Medical users who I'm speaking for need a floor of quality. I don't believe there's anybody that's not buying from the regulated market because of price. You can buy a $50 ounce out in the stores. That's insane. And at the going price for a black market ounce is about $150. So nobody's not buying because of price. Here's the trick for people like me. You need a floor of quality. Currently, that floor of quality is too expensive. So what you need to do is bring that quality to a price. It's, it's not an either or. It's that floor of quality at a price that can be obtainable. So let me give you an example of how we're trying to address that. So that floor of quality can be gotten usually in DOH compliant product. What we're trying to do is get that excise tax taken off. Um, so you, so patients who, uh, because of their illnesses are notoriously poor, uh, chronic illness will tend to make you poor. So they can access that higher priced product with that floor of quality. So you're not just trying to, to say, okay, here's a $7 a gram ounce, um, and we're gonna take 37% off. The, the purpose is to try and take that 16 or $17 uh, a gram ounce and get it down to, you know, $12 or $10 and, and make that, um, make that higher quality um, product accessible uh, to people with chronic illness who may be higher quality users. So it's not a this or that, it's a higher quality product needs to come down in price. Now, maybe if you get more people buying that, then production on scale might have, you know, might push that price down um, for people maybe who don't want to get in the database. So, you know, I go in and I ask for the product and it's not on the shelf um, because fewer people buy it because it's higher priced. And so the buyer in the store doesn't want to buy it. So there's this whole feedback system that's making that higher quality medical product collapse, but it's not lower price. You can buy I mean, this this stuff here that I said that's got 170,000 CFUs of, of mold, it's very tempting for patients because it's so dirt cheap. The problem is you can't consume it. It, it, it. It's not safe for human consumption. So it's really, it's more complex than one or the other. It, we need to get higher quality product more accessible to people. And again, that's a complicated problem, but that's my answer. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Megan. Yes, um, with me, I, I, I agree. There, it's not necessarily price point. It's, I am definitely looking for a quality product that looks good under my scope and um, doesn't have any mold. And I know that there's premium strains out there, there's caviar strains, et cetera, et cetera. But um, for an old schooler like me, there is absolutely a price I won't pay no matter how good the cannabis is. Um, I won't pay more than $140 an ounce. And that is at the top quality, the best you can get the you know knock you on your butt whatever you want to call it that is the maximum i'm willing to pay but i'm looking at close to 100 an ounce anything below that makes me question why it looks like that um but i have found that a lot of times it's due to outdoor growth so sometimes it's worth that 50 dollar ounce because it just doesn't look as pretty it has dirt on it it's grown outdoors and people don't like things that aren't pretty but it makes a great medicine so if you're looking at that, that's a way to go. Um, but that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking to bridge the gap. 
But I also know from the grower's perspective, that's really hard to do. The growers are killing themselves to just stay alive. And so many of them are losing money because they're not the ones getting paid. And so I, when I see these $60 ounces and stuff, I'm like, well, if we had a better average of, you know, say $100 an ounce as a general price point, then maybe some that are, you know, struggling would be able to survive. And others that are too big for their britches could come down a notch. That's that's how I feel. Thank you very much, Megan. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael. Yeah. Uh, so the in my view, the problem is is uh, that there are different standards right now uh, when it comes to trying to differentiate quality and price and and where those meet. Um, if uh, you were to survey customers that come into my store, some people are chiefly concerned with quality. They'll pay whatever we ask. And then another percentage of customers are chiefly concerned with price. They have no choice but to be, um, to have uh, their budget determine their options. And those, those percentages, if you were to look at the demographics, they're not gonna change much no matter what happens in the industry. Most people are either doing one of those purchases or the other. And we're talking percentages. There are a percentage of medical customers as well who are not going to change their habits. Um, that being said, what can change, and again, this is the topic at hand, so I'm hoping I'm bringing us back to the point, is that the pesticide testing standards can be expanded to cover both medical and recreational products alike. And if you do that, it forces everybody to follow the same standards. It's a fixed cost. What you will see is a temporary spike in prices across the board, and then the prices will come right back down because everyone will be forced to compete at the same level. In Oregon, you can still get ounces just as cheap as you could before the new testing standards were put in place. The testing that's performed now probably costs about three times as much as it used to cost for the lab to perform the test, but that has not changed the price to the consumer in that state. Um, and I'm just really hoping that we can stick to that subject matter as we move forward here, because trying to uh, you know concern ourselves with a, a smaller demographic might be actually taking steps backwards. Um, safety for everybody is, I think, the topic at hand. Yeah, agreed. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, Nancy. Hi. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate your comments about that, Michael, because, you know, when you think about there is no, quote, average consumer, there's just a huge diversity of different types of consumers uh, who are using it or looking for using it for completely different reasons. And Everybody's going to have their budget. Everybody's going to have their uh, priorities for the effect that they're looking for and, and whether they're going to get the results that they want. So if we think of safety as the right of the consumer, much like you would want for, you know, the same types of regulations for other food products uh, for human consumption to be standardized enough that most of the time consumers can feel safe and that if something is dangerous or toxic, it can be identified quickly and removed from the shelves. Uh, we're a long way from that. I don't know how we will ever get there because diversity is also one of the unique um, benefits of the cannabis world. Uh, is that it can have so much diversity, much like the wine industry. It becomes a connoisseur versus the, you know, everyday um, get get my one joint a day and I'm a happy camper kind of. Uh, and, and each is a valid customer, a very valid customer and deserves the same uh, consideration for safety. So how we find that middle ground, um, I don't know, but I think it's worth uh, looking into. Uh, and that goes on through the process, because like I said, I will occasionally bake flour, but I'm mostly using uh, tinctures and very few edibles because for one, I don't want the sugar. Two, I don't want the color dyes. Those can be very toxic for a lot of the candy-like uh, edibles. Uh, and even some of the um, 
uh, aromatic additives to some topicals can be prohibitive for sensitive people. So a lot of it goes back to buyer beware, unfortunately. I think that's always going to be part of this industry because it's already grown so fast and so far that I don't know that we'll, we won't ever be able to put put the, you know, the rabbit back in the cage. It's out. So now we have to do what we can to make it as safe for the most people, regardless of their use. Thank you very much, Nancy. And then finally, Shauna. Oh, well, I, I think quality is the most important. I feel like everybody kind of really felt that too. Um, and nobody should be smoking that moldy weed that that John showed that should be not be on the market. That's definitely of a concern. Nobody should have anything that's not safe for consumption. So that that's priority. I do think that the the balance in the middle with the price versus quality, quality being the focus, but finding that balance might be to separate again the medical recreation market, the recreation market, our tourists, yeah, let's take their money. Come on, bring that money to Washington. We want that money. We've got all kinds of stuff here, but for our local community, for the for the, our patients, I think if they were able to get, um, if I were able to do different types of purchases, buying caps or tinctures that were uh, designed for medical patients that don't have, you know, it's not candy. I don't want candy. Yet that were 100 milligram dosages, um, things like that, I think would be really, uh, maybe help with medical patients in that price. Cause those are the people who are really price, you know, the ones who are regularly buying, that price is really important to them. And then, and then the tourists, I mean, you know, they're on vacation. So price isn't necessarily important on that side of the market. I think that's two different situations and maybe that's how the balance can be met. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, anything between the panel, any feedback for one another before we move to the next question? All right, um, the third question we have, and it, and it is kind of similar to the, the previous question, but if you have anything to add, and we'll start with John, in what ways does the regulated system meet your needs as a consumer? And in what ways does it not? And I think we've already kind of touched on this, but this was a common theme in the questions that were posed to this panel. So if you could just take a couple minutes, anything that you haven't touched on, John, that you want to add with respect to question three? Anything I want to add? Um, yeah. No, I would say that there are spotty um, points of access I would prefer to buy from a regulated store. Um, there are certain buyers when I can find their products in stores that I like to go to. I prefer that uh, uh, over the unregulated market. Um, where what it needs is mandatory testing, test side testing, whether that be testing a farm a few times a year or each and every product. I certainly think concentrates needed to be tested per batch. Um, we need a floor of of testing quality and i need to know that when i go in that there there's some standard there as opposed to some theoretical standard that maybe that farm got tested at some time that's not acceptable um the other thing i would really like is i would like to have more um recreational product is different from medical product for me and I would like to be able to go in and have, you know, those ratios of cannabinoids and have some place in the store where it's not, the whole market right now seems like it's driven by price and high THC. And that's just, just doesn't serve me at all. And there needs to be some small percentage of the market that it doesn't take an act of God to find that other product. So that kind of sums up everything for me okay thank you very much john I actually, is that okay oh, i just um wanted to mention too that we were talking about labels and additional testing well uh, the product packages are small it's hard to put a lot of information that's legible and easy to read on a label but i wonder if instead um there could be like 
a lab sheet upon request that the store can have with each lot that they purchase where they have their lab results like that actual lab sheet on hand. So if customers would like something that's easier to read a little more detailed, um, then maybe it could just be available upon demand. Can I yeah, step in there? Sure. We have is packaging and labeling rules, by the way, that there should be on the on demand materials like that. Yeah. Can okay. I step in there? That is already the law. Yeah. That is oh, already the law. It's hard to get. Sometimes people don't stores don't have it anyway, but that yeah. is already yeah. a requirement. Any anytime I have asked for detailed information or lab results, I'm looked at like I'm speaking. Week. Yeah, I know it, but that is already a requirement. Okay, <laughs> gotcha. Because that, that seems like the to, easiest way to go. I wanted to say, Shauna, that is part of the requirement for packaging and labeling under Act 314.55.105. Yeah, that those things be made available. But I appreciate your comment that it's it sounds like it's not as readily available as you would like to see as a consumer of those products. Correct. And um, that's, you know, several different stores um, asking them, you know, for the sheet and the bud tenders clearly, in my experience, have no idea they're supposed to be able to provide that. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael. Yes. Even though I realize you're a, 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 a store owner, how does this question sit with you? <laughs> so as far, well, first of all, I'm not a store owner. Um, I, I run a store that's owned by a federally recognized right. tribe. Uh, so I just kind of represent, but yeah. um, as far as, you know, uh, putting the consumer first. Is it number four that we're talking about here? Um, in what ways does a regulated system meet your needs as a consumer and what ways does it not? So what's your been what's been your experience in hearing from consumers when you're running the store? So again, I have to speak for multiple demographics if I'm if I'm trying to um, give the consumer perspective because I would say we have if I were to split it into maybe three demographics, uh, I we have our budget shoppers, we have our high quality shoppers, and we have our therapeutic needs shoppers. I think that'd be a good way of splitting it into three groups. And um, really, at the end of the day, I, I think that the pesticide testing standards that are in place right now are filling all three groups. I don't think that any one of those groups should be lacking a concern for the safety of the product that they're consuming they might have in any given moment a certain active level of concern for that safety, but that also, that level of concern is gonna represent their, their uh, awareness of what the, what the dangers might be. You take someone who's unaware of the dangers and you list them out for them, you've probably changed their mind and turned them from an unconcerned person to a concerned person. If every single person who shopped in our store got a nice full speech about what pesticide testing standards currently exist and what they could be, I think that 99% of those people would be asking for higher standards. So, you know, the needs being met, people who have medical needs, their needs are definitely greater than those of the the budget shopper who's trying to get the best deal on an ounce of cannabis that they can possibly find. There are immunocompromised uh, cancer survivors who cannot have exposure to certain compounds. Those people have uh, needs that uh, we could say are a higher priority than maybe the needs of that person looking for the cheapest ounce. That being said, I think that we're failing every single consumer that walks into the store if we do not increase our standards. And, and bring them up to at least somewhere comparable to the standards in Oregon. Um, you know, there are people expressing in the chat here that their businesses would not survive those high standards. Back in 2016, 
all of the state laboratories and many of the growers in the state who were not using safe standards, they all threw their hands up in the air and they said, oh, this is gonna put everyone out of business. No, it forced everyone to evolve. It is probably the safest place in the country to buy cannabis because everybody's been forced to follow these standards. Even the people growing six plants in their backyard, four plants in their backyard, they probably don't even have access to the chemicals that might otherwise make their products unsafe because those products aren't being used in the industry and therefore are less available to purchase on the market. Um, let's just raise the bar for everybody here. Great, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, uh, Nancy. Um, thank you, Michael, for that. I, I really relate to how you described or, or distinguished between the various consumer groups and price and quality are not mutually exclusive, but safety for any consumer should be uh, our priority as people in the industry. I mean, if, if whether we're using it for ourselves or we want it for our family, friends and neighbors uh, or our customers, if we happen to be in the industry, why wouldn't we want to be able to offer the safest possible products. And, you know, if Oregon has shown that that it can evolve to the benefit of, of the consumer, then I'm all for that. Uh, because, you know, the industry has exploded so quickly in such a short period of time that we're kind of moving backwards and trying to make it uh, better for everybody rather than just one segment. And I think that's an important part. And and the, the medical needs should be as important as your average consumer when it comes to being safe. And uh, budget is true for people at, in all of those categories. You know, um, as a senior on a limited income, budget is a very important part of how I decide. I'm fortunate, I can microdose. I can stretch a, you know, a gram of, of an RSO or a FICO oil and make it last for a month because it doesn't take much for me to get the benefit that I'm seeking. But that's not true for a lot of people. And so um, I'm, I'm hopeful that by conversations like this, we can find that middle ground of both quality, safety and affordability for the greatest number of people and to help those who need it the most for medical reasons, give them uh, the tax breaks that they need. Um, I think that's a real important part of it. Great, thank you, Nancy. And Shauna. Oh, I think that the regulated system meets the needs because there's plenty of cannabis on every corner, anywhere, in a pinch. If I needed some dire medicine, it's readily available on all the corners. But what it doesn't meet is my specific needs. I have to go across the lake to get a one-to-one -one I have to go across the lake to get a clean green dab. Um, it's it's um, to get the quality that I need as a medical patient. I have to travel and I have to buy um, and I buy in large amounts because then I can get more points. And then with the more points, I can get more of a you know better price on my medicine. So so these are all things that I, I for me. My first husband put it this way. He was in construction. He said quality price or time choose two <laughs> you think about that right so um i choose quality and price which means i spend a lot of time driving around getting it and that's my input okay thank you very much so we are we are going gonna go a little bit over just want to ask you folks on the panel one more question um so bear with me let me see if i can advance this Um, and, and I think we've talked a lot about this question already that's on the screen now, describes the level of comfort with the safety of the product and regulated system. I think we've, we've touched on that in, in many of the responses that you've offered. Um, but, uh, and we've also talked about contaminants that, that the panel expressed concern about. So I think we'll, we've, we've largely answered that question. But I wanted to speak to this, I was hoping the panel could speak to this final question 
um, because it really does pertain to the cannabis uh, quality control rules that we've been working on. And, and the question is, would you be comfortable if a farm was subject to multiple testing multiple times per year, or would you prefer that each lot is tested? So if you could take one or two minutes and sort of speak to that, and we'll start with John. So I think I would. Um, I might have some issues with mold testing. Um, but I think I probably would um, have be comfortable with a farm that was subject to testing if it was mandatory, if we knew it was happening. That, and, and let me make a, another exception besides mold. And that would be for concentrates. You know, concentrates are so problematic. I think those would probably have to be tested per batch. Okay. That's all Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Megan. Um, I emphatically <laughs> am not okay with just a few tests a year um, because I have seen things from multiple perspectives within the growings. And especially in Northwest Washington, powdery mildew is a huge, huge problem for growers. It's incredibly unsafe to consume. And if they did not have to test each lot, um, there'd be so much more of it going out into the market and causing more problems. Um, however, like as I see it, I don't even think sampling one per lot is good enough because the lot is a large section and they pick the best of the best and send it in because they only have to send in a gram or two. And then that is considered the statistics for the entire lot, which a lot of us know that from the top of the plant to the middle of the plant to the bottom of the plant, it's going to produce different results. Now, I don't know what the solution is to that because more testing means more cost to the grower and they already are eating the majority of the cost and having a hard time surviving. And so, no, it's not fair to tell them that they have to do another thousand dollars in testing for every single lot. However, if we are primarily concerned with safety, we need to test every lot. In fact, it would be better if we pulled three random samples from the same lot, sent them all in to be tested, and the label was an average of the three samples. Because it can change that much from the bottom to the top of the plant, and that much in within a lot. And so, um, but again, how, how do we make that happen? when I'm seeing things that if I have to do another test, it's another $500 per lot. Well, that's not reasonable either, but we have to be putting out a safe product. And if we only test the grower three times a year, then um, that's a whole lot of time that they can just slide through product that they know isn't good enough because nobody's checking it. So that's how I feel. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Megan. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike. Uh, so I I really agree with just about everything Megan just just said there. Those are uh, many of the same points that I would raise in saying that it is not a good idea to allow a farm to just be tested a few times a year. Uh, there are so many variables. That's I want to circle back to that point, and and Megan named several of them there. Um, the one thing that I've mentioned a couple times is the fact that, uh, you know, down in Oregon, they test for so many more compounds than we test here. Well, that was only part of the difference. The other big difference that I've noted is the oversight of the laboratories. The thing that happened when I, when I talked about that story where the grower I trusted um, suddenly had his product testing way over the limit, um, that was a that was a laboratory giving bad results. That was a laboratory saying his product was safe, giving those results directly to us. So they weren't even coming from him, they were coming from the laboratory. And when laboratory oversight was implemented down there, that is when we started seeing all these false, uh, false reports. So um, if we have less testing occurring overall, that is, that is less opportunity to catch a lab 
being shady. And we know now, just this year alone, that, th that there are labs that are terrible offenders. 1,200 submitted lab reports is a crazy high number. And I do not believe that would have been possible if there were a state agency actively inspecting the small handful of laboratories that are going to be performing these laboratory tests. It is completely possible that it, for us to do what a smaller state with less infrastructure is doing just south of here. And, and it can be done in a way where the, the cost is not entirely passed on to the consumer or the grower. It is a system that evolved down there, and I think we can evolve it here too. Great, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, Nancy. I really appreciated what uh, all three of the other panelists have said so far about this. And I, I love the idea of shared expense in particular, that it shouldn't all fall to the grower, uh, that if some of that taxable income to the state could be fed back into the re regulatory process to help monitor labs and to do spot checks with farms in between lots, I think there's value in both of those because sometimes the if, if a, a farm has toxicity on their property, uh, that could get caught, that could be remedied, and then from then on out, their products could be much safer. Uh, so um, I think looking at other states that are doing successful testing and having better results is always a good idea. And to look to share the expenses also uh, would be really helpful. So I, I don't think it's an either or, whether it's multiple testing you know, during the year or each lot, I think it needs to be a combination of both. And particularly when you get to the processing part of it, processed products need to be tested again, even after where the original oil came from in terms of the farm or the plant. Very much. Uh, Sorry, I, I think everybody said it right, uh, and I agree. I think it should be every lot. I, as a grower, I've I've had a bad, I've had a bad grow, and you know, I just grew another batch. And so sometimes growers, you know, they can, you know, I don't think you can really test what they're doing. You need to test every lot because they can they can have some bad batches and when depending on when the person goes out there to test that may not be detected i i liked what nancy said to expand on that i do like the idea of having um you know some regulations from the tax money that kind of helps uh with that instead of it going on to the growers as as megan pointed out would is, is kind of hard on them and you know michael said it too like that there's a way to do it so maybe investigating that but but also the two or three visits that uh, Nancy suggested that we could continue to do in, in tandem with the lot testing. What if that were uh, an educational program, like you know, having someone come out to each farm and just kind of educating with them on what they could do better instead of uh, maybe going there to look for what they're doing wrong, going out there with the mind of educating everybody, um, you know, like that. Great, thank you. Thanks very much. All right. So that concludes our moderated uh, panel discussion. We are about nine minutes over, so I'm going to move um, into the next segment of today's um, discussion, and that is um, focused on questions from our audience or questions that may have come in in the chat box that could be posed to the panel that have to do with cannabis product testing. So I'm gonna uh, move over to um, Casey and Audrey, who I believe have been monitoring the chat box. Um, uh, so Casey, can you kick us off here with um, the first question or raise hand? Hi, Kathy. Um, so Hi. we do have one raised hand if we want to start there. Um, so Crystal okay. Oliver has her hand raised if we want to start there. Sounds good. So let's unmute Crystal. 
Hi, Crystal. Hi, uh, Crystal Oliver, Oliver here. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Washington Sun Growers Industry Association. Uh, there's been some debate about where and when in the growing and harvesting and packaging process pesticide testing should take place. Um, would you all be comfortable with pesticide testing that was done at harvest level with more tests done when more weight was harvested? I'm ha happy to answer that. I would be because I feel that um, until it's on its way to the consumer, like that is when we need to know exactly what still remains in it or what um, hazards may still in the product or are in the product. Along the way, um, I'm not as concerned about, I'm concerned about the end product that ends up in the store. So I would be happy with that at harvest time. Um, others, let's let's just go down the line. John, do you have a response that you can offer Crystal? So I, I think anything that's processed needs to be tested at the end, right? You can't test at harvest and then turn that into a concentrate. Um, harvest level. So what are the alternatives? I guess I need to educate myself. What would be an uh, Crystal? What would be an alternative to that? Well, I mean, we right now we have a lot based system, right? So we're testing every five pounds for cannabinoids. And I think that's a good place for maybe cannabinoids. But if we're flour and I agree with you on the on extracts and concentrates, like I think there's another level of testing that needs to take place on that end product. But when it comes to flour, like I, I guess I'm proposing that we that we do the pesticide testing at each harvest and that the amount of testing done and the submitted for testing would vary depending on the size of that harvest. So like when you harvest a room, you would do tests based on the amount of, of weight that's harvested from that room or you know, you're, when you harvest an outdoor field, you would test have multiple tests based on that field. Okay, as opposed to the per strain testing, is that what you're saying? Yeah, per strain or per per lot, as was previously proposed in the in the rules, right? So um, I think it is. I think that's a decent conversation to have if things are tested in the same space, right? Uh, we know that some strains are more susceptible to mold and some other problems, but if they're in the same growing space, um, I think there's a really good argument to make to make for um, testing per harvest in that space, uh, regardless of strain, um, if that's what you're talking about. The, the only thing I think is that you need third party testers. I think that's the key to anything that we do here. I, I think. Um, I think where you get mischief is in when um, farmers are cherry picking their samples. I think that's where it gets more problematic. I, I can answer your question. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I just um, wanted to toss out there like so we sample per lot and so regardless of strains would be okay if we weren't also sampling for THC and CBD levels, but since we are, then I guess it matters which, you know, that it remains one strain or another. And um, so I just wanted to, you know, throw that out there and we absolutely need lab regulation. Um, not too long ago, there was a lab that got in trouble because every sample sent to them would come out with, you know, three to seven percent heightened THC content. So they were fudging it. I think we need to make sure that there is no way that a lab can profit off falsifying anything because they are regulated. They are a third party. They can't profit from doing anything that isn't accurate and that lab standards need to be held at a pretty high level. And so I think that's the first place to start is to make sure that the labs are doing their job correctly, then deciding what additional labs need to be done. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I want to reach out to other members of 
this panel, Michael um, and Crystal, I don't know if you need to repeat your question, but Michael, would you like to respond to Crystal's question? Um, I'm just going to say that I believe the best possible practice for testing is going to be more testing and as close to the consumer as possible. And that would be the rule I would apply across the board. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. Um, Nancy wanted to touch base with you on Crystal's question as well. Well, I would repeat what Michael says. I think, you know, the closer it gets to the consumer, the better it is. And looking again outside the box we're already in, the idea of testing labs as much as we test the growers. I think that's an important thing. Uh, you know, if if it's not able to be authentic, uh, something happened uh, in the store where I work, the manager tried a, a edible, uh, just one, and felt ill for a couple of days afterwards. So because he had access to a lab, he had it sent in and the percent of, I think it was the, uh, the propane was like, way above what the minimum uh, safe range would be, and yet it had somehow passed, got through, and was on the store shelf. So um, I don't know how we tighten the regulations without choking, you know, the various players, and I think that's an important part. I think if we find a way to see it as a cooperative venture with the consumer as the most important variable rather than the bottom line or, um, you know, having, you know, whatever other priorities everybody else has. I think if we shift to know that that we're all in this together and if we work together to create a quality product that benefits the most people most of the time, then it's a win-win for everybody. Great. Thank you very much, Nancy. I, I just had a quick thought. Um, we if I Megan, could we call on Shauna really quick? Oh, sure. And then we'll follow up with you. Uh, Shauna, your thoughts on Crystal's question. And Crystal's question in particular, I, I you know, is I like the as close to the consumer because you know things can change along the way. But I think that the point John brought up is that third party testing, I think that might help get some of that that mischievous activity out of the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And maybe the third party testing was a part of the LCB board. So somebody who's not profiting, so somebody doesn't have anything to gain off of that. Sure. Thank you. Thanks very much. And then circling back to Megan, I think you had something you wanted to add as well. I think I figured it out actually. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I right. think. Um, Nancy's trying to say something it looks like, but I think her mic is off. <laughs> okay. So yeah. calling on Nancy, is there a uh, I really appreciated the comment that Shauna made about using the LCB as an educational uh, vehicle as well as a regulatory vehicle. That if you know, because there's new folks every place along the way, there's very seasoned people all along the way, and it's also an ever-changing industry. So to help stay people up to date educationally by having third parties come in and evaluate, you know, the grow operation, you know, making small changes that can lead to a better product. That's true for every step of the, of the production process. And so if it becomes an educational priority rather than a punitive priority for intervention, I think that, that again is a win-win for everybody. Yeah, just to offer a little bit of feedback on that, the, the agency has moved into uh, education and compliance based model in right. the last couple of years. And so we're really taking some efforts to move in that direction. Yeah, I yeah, saw that. Just, I was very impressed with that, Kathy. So thank you. And, and I think that's a win win, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> but I think I hear you saying, let's let's support and enhance those efforts moving forward. I think that's what I'm hearing. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. So, um, uh, on to the next question. Casey, I see a hand raised by Micah Sherman. Can we unmute Micah? Uh, 
so Kate's here. Uh, uh, thank you. Hey there. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Micah. Um, as some people have mentioned in the chat, there's a, uh, there's a program and a relationship between the WSDA and the Liquor Control Board that provides some form of uh, random pesticide testing of end products in stores, as well as some spot check testing of farms on sites. Um, that program could be dramatically expanded for significantly less money than doing a lot of the pesticide and heavy metals testings through a private lab. So my question would be, would you all rather see that testing done by private laboratories or by an expansion in the budget to the testing program that the WSDA has in place? Okay, thank you for that question, Michael. So, uh, Micah, sorry. So, let's start with John. So, I want to see consistent testing. I don't want to dump on anybody, but I have to say I, I'm not impressed by Washington State's follow through on any part of cannabis policy. Um, I would rather have a mandatory expectation. I, I'm not, um, I think random testing is fine and good. I don't think it should in any case replace a mandatory regime. Just, just to clarify, okay. I'm not saying either or on that front. I'm saying expand the, the publicly owned testing labs capacity to do the harvest or farm or lot level testing around pesticides. That's what I'm saying, like modify that program so it was more expansive versus pay so the private You're lab. basically saying instead of confidence doing the testing, then WSDA would do the testing. Is that what you're saying? Right, I'm saying so all other things being equal, assuming that the, the sampling's the same and the how many tests are done and all of that, assuming all other things are the same, is there a positive or negative feeling about private or public lab testing? So I, I think private labs are more incentivized to cheat. Um, again, I'm really uncomfortable with Washington State's follow through on their, even their mandated commitments. So, um, I'm not opposed to that idea. I mean, I don't, nothing about it makes me feel uncomfortable. I'd have to think about it more. Let me put it that way, but I don't, I don't have any opposition to that. You asked about feeling, I don't have any negative feeling about it. It might be cheaper. Um, I, I worry that Washington state sets its own rules and if something gets a little odd, then, then, you know, Washington State hasn't been good about following the state's own rules, and and I I get that it's less inclined to mischief that might happen in private labs. So say six of one, half a dozen of the other. That's okay. sorry, that's not very satisfying, but that's my feeling. All right, thanks, John. Um, uh, I just wanted to to remind folks about the conversations going on in the chat. Um, let's uh, make sure that we're being kind to each other in the chat. Um, and that, uh, you know, some of the comments that we're sharing are productive to um, this conversation and that the conversations in the chat also help us understand each other and help all of us understand um, each other's position. So just as a reminder, thank you. So with respect to this question, um, I'd also, uh, let, let's move on to Megan. Um, I, I feel about the same way, as long as, you know, the, the lab standards are all the same across the board and there's somebody regulating the labs, um, I'm not really concerned about who does it as long as they all have to follow the same regulations. 
And it actually makes me bring up a question. I probably, I wish I knew the answer, but as far as edibles are concerned, is the FDA involved in any way, considering it's a federal thing? I'm just curious as to what exactly um, the requirements are for the food that the edible cannabis is placed in. Do we have FDA requirements in regards to that? And what uh, what ingredients can be in those things um, as far as food safety goes? I feel like if it's something being consumed, it should be um, held up to the same regulation as anything else we consume. So yeah. that's where I'm at. There are, uh, I know there's WSD standards. I don't think there are FDA standards specific to cannabis edibles at this time. Yeah. Just okay, general gotcha. food state. Yeah. I hope food that safety. helps. Okay, yeah. thank you. Of course. Uh, Michael. Uh, yeah, so I, I think that in this case, that would, if we did more WSDA uh, spot checks, and um, I would definitely be inclined towards uh, uh, testing products off the shelves, off the shelves randomly. That's the best way you're going to catch what the consumer is exposed to. Um, that would just be another uh, check and balance to make sure that the labs are not falsifying their reports, because. Um, you know, if WSDA goes and finds product on a shelf that says it's safe and then it turns out it has elevated levels of X, Y, Z, well, then that lab can get in deep trouble, maybe be suspended for six months or whatever. Enforcement is going to be a very big part of this because we could put all kinds of regulations in place and it won't matter if they're not enforced. Um, a lot of this conversation is sprawled from, you know, what what is the retailer doing? What is the grower doing? What is the lab doing? I feel that we should be focusing on what is the state doing because that's kind of the we're talking about what the state can do with their regulations. And um, you know, if there are more ways for the state to check the laboratories and make sure that they aren't falsifying reports, then that is what we need. Um, earlier, Nancy mentioned you know uh you know the idea of uh labs falsifying reports i think megan touched on it too if you want to use a good metaphor um talk about a drug dealer and a drug buyer if we're if all drugs are illegal um the lab is the drug dealer they're the dealer they're the, they're the uh bigger offender in this case you know um they're the ones selling the thing that's illegal so uh, I think that they need to be held to a higher standard. Any way we do that is going to be helpful. And um, just talking about higher standards, as far as the state applying higher standards, uh, I've mentioned Oregon several times, but there is one standard that I don't think uh, exists for cannabis in our country yet, and that is regulation of glyphosate. Um, many of you guys know what Roundup it is the target of several class action lawsuits because there is data showing that it can cause all kinds of health problems, including tumors. Um, we are at a point where glyphosate might be so ubiquitous in our soil and groundwater that um, there is no way to get your hands on wine grown in eastern Washington or California that does not show some level of glyphosate. However, this is a good example of where the rubber meets the road on the business side of things. Labs will tell you that it's not affordable to test for glyphosate on a regular basis because it is a single analyte compound and they need to really calibrate their equipment to look for it. It's, it's something that would actually elevate the cost of, of lab reports across the board. Um, that being said, I think everyone, everyone on this panel would probably like to know if glyphosate is in their cannabis. Great, thank you, Michael. All right, moving on to Nancy. I second that about the glyphosate issue. I've been aware of that for a long time and um, coming as a child uh, of age in the Midwest where it was first used in large farming operations, um, over time, I can just see how the overall health of that farming area has gone down and down and down and uh, it has to be 
uh, one of the factors. So uh, if, if everyone had to test for it, then the cost of it of the testing would go down because it would be more in demand. And so, you know, supply and demand could fit the testing model as much as it can any of the other product models. So why not say that we, we go for, you know, again, if high quality is our objective and we know that glyphosate's been around for 50 years or more, uh, if people are brought to account for that, then they have to make the change. I just think it, it just makes sense. So I would, I would second that. Thank you very much, Nancy. And Shauna. Oh, I, I took notes. Everybody said something super interesting and different. Um, Glyphosate, phosphate, just quickly. Um, people aren't really gluten intolerant, they're glyophosphate intolerant. They use that to help wheat berries pop up and have their harvest timed. And so look into that. <laughs> um, um, I think the original question though was about one lab doing multiple, being able to do multiple testings. So it wouldn't go to, out to multiple labs to kind of be cost effective and time effective. And I think that was the question, right? I just want to clarify the question. I'm talking about a publicly owned lab versus a privately owned lab, not about the number of labs. Okay, That's gotcha. my real question is, who owns the lab and is that important to you? I think that privately owned labs tend to, to spark more ingenuity and that tends to to further, you know, what, how fast and things can be produced and how well and new machines. It's just great, but I do think publicly uh, should be checked on. So just followed up and um, tested. The, the the private lab should be tested publicly. So kind of in a in a chain of events. Um, did I answer your question? Because I have another note here about the WSDA. I looked up, somebody put a link in there about the edibles, and it says here, just to, just because it was really interesting here, um, if it's recognized, you may put it in there, if it's recognized by the FDA. So even though the FDA is not approving it, the WSDA is saying, it. you know, if the FDA says it's approved, then we'll say it's approved. So they're kind of still using that same guideline. I think that answered everything here. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Shauna. <laughs> All right. Um, I thought I saw another hand raised. Casey, Audrey, was I, did that hand uh, go down? It looks like there's a question from Lonnie. Can we unmute Lonnie so she can ask her question? Actually, it, it wasn't a question, which is why my hand went down. I did just want to address as a QA manager in the cannabis space, uh, the, the questions about uh, FDA or regulation in that regard. Um, I actually come from FDA, USDA regulated food and have recently moved into the cannabis space. And prior to leaving uh, federally regulated food, I basically got told by our USDA inspector that the government has said we can't do any regulation in that regard. It has to be re regulated by state entities. So right now it is all, um, as far as edibles go, on the WSDA shoulders. And um, it's not quite the same being regulated by the state as it is being regulated by the federal government in terms of food safety. But uh, we're here, we're doing the work. So if anybody has any questions in that regard, I'm available. Great. Thank you very much for that, Lonnie. Appreciate it. Yeah, I just want to say thank you, too. Thank you for clarifying where we stand. <laughs> very helpful. All right, turning to Casey and Audrey, you've been monitoring the chat box. Are there any questions related to cannabis product testing for the panel that we have not addressed yet? Hi, uh, this is Kathy, or excuse me, Kathy, this is Casey, can you hear me? I think I've been trying to talk to you guys on mute uh, this whole time, so I apologize. Go ahead, we can hear you, Casey. Okay, 
So it looks like Jim McRae <laughs> did have a question a little bit ago. He uh, wanted to ask the panel, what does the panel think about having the LCB at a COA request to uh, the purchase attempts that are done during youth sales compliance checks once those start again? Can you repeat that? Yeah, and Jim, would you feel comfortable going on uh, the mic and asking that question? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, yeah. Jim. Okay, yeah, yeah. and the ahead. question was, there, there was a discussion about the certificates of Alice uh, retail stores and asked to see them. It is very common that the stores, A, are not able to produce them, and B, don't even know what you're talking about. And that, I just want to point out that, first of all, in the case for the better part of five years that I'm aware of, and it is a situation that has been shared repeatedly with the LCB in public forum, in numerous forums relating to this. My suggestion and question for the panel was, what do you think about a solution here or some enforcement actually starts being done against this this thing. And the suggestion that I made for discussion with the panel, which I have made before with the, on numerous occasions, is since they're going there anyways and checking on retailers, not right now, I recognize that, doing the, the underage purchase attempts, <laughs> why not act into that script if a purchase is being made that the, um, and ask for a copy of the COA and just your assessment to see if the retailer is able to do that. It strikes me as being a minimal effort and would get would at least introduce some enforcement, which means there might actually be some enforcement. We can talk up a good game, but nothing's gonna happen. What does the panel think about that? Okay, go as ahead, John. So um there's two things here. One is I really want to see a 16-year-old asking for uh, pesticide information in a store. That's something I want to see. Um, I, I agree with you that this has been an ongoing issue since forever. So in terms of some enforcement, some spot checks, absolutely support it. Great idea. Um, and it's it's very overdue, and it's one of my great frustrations with dealing with the regulated system. I, is that the right way to do that? Is it more efficient? You know, whatever that you know, that's a different question. I don't know if you're doing uh, an underage check if there's somebody else in the car that could use that opportunity. I, you know, I don't know what the logistics of that look like, but I think the suggestion is absolutely. Uh, appropriate and I think enforcement on this is overdue. Does that does that answer? Yes, thank you. Great. Thank, thank you. Megan, uh, would you like to weigh in? Um, yeah, I I think that that's probably a pretty cost effective minimal effort way to um, get the retailers back on board with making sure that that's available. Um, as John said, though, sending in an underage to try to do a buy and accomplish that at the same time, I'm not sure how effective that would be. Maybe it would be a better thing to do during spot checks or when you send somebody out to the store to check up on what they're doing anyway, make sure that they have those readily available and that the entire staff is aware that they should. And if not, there's a perfect chance to educate without an underage person trying to be the one to do the educating. <laughs> All right, Michael. So um, I'm pretty sure that in this case, just the way it would work is the, uh, the minor decoy comes in and then after the decoy attempt is made, an LCB officer uh, will follow up with the manager on duty and explain the situation. So I'm, I'm guessing that's where this request might be made by, you know, an, an adult uh, with a with a badge. That being said, um, it's almost like putting it on Safeway to make sure that uh, 
that Minute Maid is properly labeling their orange juice. I don't know if that's a requirement of the retailer to be regulating the wholesaler uh, and making sure that the wholesaler is, is giving the correct information, giving all the information, having properly labeled products. Um, that that might be the way it actually works. I'm not as familiar with the outs of gross, uh, produce regulation and that kind of thing, uh, grocery store products. But uh, I think just, just to say, um, the way other states do it, they attach the COA to the uh, state's manifest. So there's state tracking system in every uh, cannabis legal state. It's uh, you know something contracted out by the state government, created by a software design company, and it's all administered by state employees. That system should contain the COA for every product. It should be not only verifiable in there, but accessible in there. And uh, I can do that in Oregon. If I go look at metric um, data in Oregon, I can see the test results for any product that's been brought into a store. And it, I can't bring that product into that store without those test results being there in the state database. That would solve everybody's problems. So can I respond to that? Because I've spent a lot of time asking for test results. Currently, there is a law that the store has to have that. Second of all, I'd like to ask people to consider what the logistics are of what Michael's saying. I go into a store, five, five products are laid on the counter. So it's in a state database. What happens then? How do I evaluate those at the time so I can compare the products in the store where it's not where it's not me going home and going, oh, there's five products, oh, I don't like any of them, I go to the store. Information is not useful unless it's easily accessible at the time of service, period. And, and so I'll, let me t share a positive experience I have. It's not typical. If I go into um, Denk's Wonderporium or whatever the name of that place is, if I go in and I point to a thing and I say, can you, What's the pesticide information? What's the test results on that? They pull up a big binder and they lay it on the counter. That's not the usual experience, but I have access to that information right then and there, which I believe is the state rule anyway. So we can have all this information and it can come into the store. But if I'm the consumer and I am making my own decision about what my acceptable you know, risks are or you know, what it is I'm looking for, I need access to that at the counter at the time of purchase for a variety of products and anything outside of that system I don't feel is useful. That's Just so to address that concern, if you were to enter our store, we have uh, well over a thousand products for you to select and to navigate the um, lab certificates that we receive, they wouldn't even fit in one binder. Um, it's not possible to fit them all in one binder. Um, if I want to quickly give you, the consumer, access to five specific hand-selected products, and that, that might be located in five different binders, if we were to, say, have a paper compilation of all our lab results, that would not be an efficient way to present you the information. That being said, I do have file boxes full of paper COAs ready to be asked for if anyone ever wants me to sift through them for an hour. That being said, attached to a state database where I quickly type in a keyword or type in four characters from that lot SKU brings up an instant result. And I just show, print, explain that result however I want to communicate it. That is getting the information in a timely manner. Paper being held on site in file boxes, it's it's not even remotely practical. So I, I if if I can access that database at the counter, I'm fine with that. It doesn't have to be paper products. Yeah, I was just going to say that too. It sounds like you have discovered the absolute best way to provide that quickly um, without wasting a bunch of paper and having it readily available to your consumer. Sounds like genius action to me. Washington yeah. State walked it. away yeah. from a contract to do that. So. Well, and I, I just know that, you know, I'm thinking of my mom and other people that I helped select cannabis products and 
how overwhelmed they feel looking at a database. However, if they were standing there speaking to you and you could say, okay, I have this product and then look, here's the analysis on it. And then let me show you your other option. Here's that analysis. And it's right there and interactive and they can ask you questions. I think that absolutely covers it. That absolutely does what needs to be done. So awesome. That's awesome. It would help too to centralize it. You know, sometimes we receive both a paper copy and an email copy, and then we say, okay, good. That, you know, I can pull up that email, but even then, you know, over a hundred different vendors to search from for emails. So oh, something centralized oh, yeah. would be great. If you could just, you know, put in the UBI number or the, uh, you know, the lot number and it just pops up and it's all in one place, that would be ideal. Fantastic. So I would like to point out that we need an interim policy, though, because while this sounds ideal and I think I would love to have this, we still don't really have a good traceability system and we still don't know how many patients we have in the registry. So <laughs> just to be a bummer for a minute. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> if that data was available, when I order my product online and maybe in the future have it delivered to my house, I could see that data too. That would be, because that would just all be imported with, with code, you know, so, so as a, at a home, I could see that data and compare the products with an iPad in the store. But yeah, that, that'd be cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Nancy, did you want to offer anything? <laughs> well, I was thinking along those lines when Michael described it so beautifully. So thank you for that. Uh, and the comment I would add to that is, it just was <laughs> my heart to imagine all the trees it would take to print all those pieces of paper for the thousands of products in a thousand stores in just one state. You know, it just, it just, oh no, we're going in the wrong direction. So uh, the idea of a digital database and, you know, yeah, it's not immediate. It, it's going to take time, but at the rate that technology is advancing right now and with the pressure of, of more and more things needing to be digitized because of what's happened with COVID and everything else, I think the technology will quickly catch up. And I think and especially if, say, it, within a year or two, the laws change uh, at a federal level so that, you know, more of these things are now crossing state lines, that's going to become even more important. Uh, that we, we get a database that isn't just for the state of Washington, but one that could be interwoven with, you know, other states with other products because now they can ship them. Sure. All right, thank you very much, Nancy. All right, I think we have time for uh, one or two more questions. Casey, um, this I saw a uh, hand raised. Yeah, it looks like Kevin Oliver has his hand raised. All right. Hello, can you hear me? We can, go ahead, Kevin. Thank you. My name is Kevin Oliver. I sit on the executive board of directors of the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, headquartered in Washington, D.C., and I chair their National Pesticides Committee. I'd like to thank the Washington State Liquor Control Board for putting this panel together, and I'd like to thank the panelists for their perspectives. Uh, currently, there are 533 clinical trials being conducted on marijuana or cannabis. None of these are focused on the efficacy of the claims of possible or potential pathologies or mortalities associated with pesticide thresholds of inhaled marijuana pro uh, products. There's currently no documented causal evidence or current scientific studies or data to support the anecdotal assumptions of the dangers or toxicity of pesticides on mar marijuana. So my question to the panel is, do you think Washington State should fund the research in regards to establishing what pathologies, if any, may be associated with multiple pesticides or other chemicals inherent in inhaled legal consumer marijuana products. Thank you. Okay. So, do I think they should? Um, I think there should be research. I think the barriers to research are self-defeating, absurd, uh, socially harmful. Um, 
obviously my preference is that the federal government would turn off that part of the drug war and um, fund research that everybody could say this applies to everybody. Um, yeah, I think there should be research and if we the federal government can't get its act together. And I, I guess I wonder too, since what UW says they have what, two people that can do um, research on pesticides or on cannabis issues. I mean, they're, they're still the same roadblock. Um, it's frustrating. I, I don't know what the best solution is, but we need research and I think the federal barriers need to come down. And, and I don't, I think anything is a, any alternative like states doing it is a, a really undesirable second choice. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Megan, your thoughts? Um, well, I, I agree on a federal level would be much more ideal because it is, you know, the risks of pesticides and the research that we need to verify those things um, and to figure out exactly how harmful they all can be in a cannabis situation is really important. And it affects everybody, not just people in Washington state. However, the unfortunate fact is the federal government is not yet on board and who knows how long it will take. So in this situation, Washington is on its own to regulate its own cannabis market. And if Washington truly um, wants to make sure it's only allowing safe product out there, then yeah, if there's research that needs to be done, that falls on us again, because unfortunately the federal government is not on board. And I do believe it should be their responsibility, <laughs> but until they get on board, it's not going to be. And I think we actually do have at least some medical research that's been done that proves certain pesticides are incredibly harmful to inhale or consume. So not having any proof that pesticides cause harm, I don't think is accurate. I'd be happy to see those links. Okay, neem oil is one that you could feel free to look up. Neem oil is not safe to be inhaled. And neem oil is steadily used on marijuana crops. And in regards to safety, um, the, question, the question specifically was, what does then neem oil do to the human body? What are the pathologies associated with the inhalation of these chemicals or molds or pesticides? And specifically, the question was, should Washington State set the precedent for the research to establish these pathologies versus arbitrary pesticides? And I feel like I, I did answer the question on whether or not Washington State should pay for testing and figure out where we stand with it. And I would be more than happy if you want to send me your email um, to pull up the information that I have found on neem oil that says um, it increases the likelihood of respiratory distress and things of that nature. It causes a lot of breathing problems when inhaled, but not when eaten. So that matters too, whether or not it's in an edible or whether or not it's meant to be inhaled. But like I said, if you wanna send me your contact information, I'd be happy to send you the reports that I have found that I have at home. I'd like to address this question from a logical perspective. Um, it doesn't matter how much money any state spends researching whether or not there are correlative or causal links from pesticide to certain health conditions. That is irrelevant, wasted money if we cannot accurately test the actual product to see what is in that product. And I think that's what this conversation is about. We're talking about whether or not we should increase standards to, uh, to a level where we can more accurately know what is in the cannabis we are smoking. We don't even know that right now. So it would be putting the cart before the horse to waste a bunch of money researching what possible causal links there might be when we don't even know whether the chemicals that could be those causes are in the product. We have to know that accurately first. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Nancy, would you like to respond to Kevin's question? Um, 
I, I don't really have anything else to add. Um, the science end of it is not my area of expertise, although I certainly value knowledge uh, about that sort of thing. Um, and what the state can do, the state can do, but research has, is so far behind the state of the industry that uh, it'll be a while before we even begin to catch up. And I like your idea, Michael, let's figure out what's there first, then figure out, you know, how we can eliminate it before we have to figure out what it's doing to people. Because so many of these things are known toxins in other circumstances, whether they're smoked or not. All right, thank you very much, Nancy. And Shauna. If our health care and our food system wasn't a for-profit system, I think that just just we wouldn't create stuff that was unhealthy for us. It would be illogical to make stuff that was unhealthy for humankind if the, we weren't profiting on it. But I don't know how we can get out of that solution. So I don't really know how I answered your question. I can't really answer your question. I think everybody else did just fine. Thank you very much, Shana. All right, thank you for that question, Kevin. Uh, Casey, let's move on. Were there any other questions in the chat that we needed to address? We're right at 416 right now. Uh, I see a lot of kind of conversation and a little bit of back and forth, but I don't necessarily see any direct questions. Um, so if somebody wants to raise a hand or if uh, I'm missing their question, if they want to repost that, um, now's, now's a good chance. All right, so we'll give folks, um, I see Kevin Oliver's hand is still raised. Do you still, do you have a follow-up question, Kevin, or are you completed? Uh, no, I'm just uh, a little technically illiterate. Sorry about that. Oh, no worries. Hey, we're all there, right? We're all trying to figure this out. So, thank can you. I, That's great. Thanks so much. Can I can I ask a question? <laughs> of course, John. So, um, every time I go into my chronic pain doctor, he gives me a speech about um, vapor pens with cartridges, and I start reading from this, and this stuff horrifies me, and it obviously horrifies him. Um, and he's been a doctor for 35 years. So on the subject of contaminants, um, how do people feel about those? Uh, you know, he talks to me about the destruction of, of the little microcells in the, in the recesses of the lungs and popcorn lung and all that. I, <laughs> I'd like to know what the other panelists, how, what's your comfort level with that stuff? John, John. I can't. I have, a, I have a. I like to uh, split this into three categories of concern because um, I, when the vape gate crisis was happening, you know, before COVID hit, and all of our attention was turned that direction, uh, evidence of of uh, different types of damage was showing. So um, it became it became clear quickly that there isn't a single culprit in the vape device category. Uh, the vitamin E, um, tocopherol acetate, that's one that was given the most attention. That causes a suffocation of the material. It actually keeps, uh, it can you know, block off your, your tissue from exposure to air. So that's one type of damage. Eagle 20, that microbutanol stuff that they spray on everything for powdery mildew, that can actually turn to cyanide during combustion and causes more of a burning type of damage in your lungs. Um, those are the two chemical concerns that have been most chiefly addressed, and I think that we're seeing those subside in our country. The big one that will still need to be addressed is the hardware, and it's uh, the oil goes into a cartridge that's made of metal and plastic, and who knows what else to bind that thing together. You have heat involved, and you have um, all kinds of potential for chemicals to off-gas, including from the metals. Uh, it is very likely that cheaper hardware from other countries, not very regulated, is where we're gonna see a continued danger on the uh, vape cartridge front. So from a QA standpoint, how can we make sure people aren't inhaling bad stuff from cheaper cartridges? 
That, it's a tough one. It's almost like, uh, for a comparison, it would almost be like regulating BPA in plastic bottles. I don't think anyone ever stepped in and said it's illegal, but you see a lot of plastic bottles and uh, uh, canned companies labeling BPA free. I think this is going to be something that is driven probably more by the consumer than by regulation because to enforce standards for hardware, I mean, I'm just using my imagination and speculating here, but I, it would be hard to imagine how they would do that. Uh, and I think it might be more about uh, consumers recognizing, uh, you know, uh, particular hardware brands and choosing those over others. Right. I'm thinking, though, that like hardware is a whole separate issue, but the product inside that hardware is definitely something we need to address. I want to know what extraction method was used. Um, so was it chemically processed or not? And uh, how much residual uh, solvent is left in any product? And if they use the filler, if so, how much of it is filler? So it's telling me I'm purchasing a gram of concentrate. Okay, how much of it is actually concentrate? How much of it is vegetable glycerin or whatever other filler they use to make it liquid enough to vaporize? Right. That's my concern. And we have no idea whether or not vaping at all is any safer for us than smoking. We haven't done the research. We don't have the data. So let's focus on what's in the cartridge and whether or not those things are even safe for consumption and at what levels. That's how I feel about those. Okay. And that's where we can start for sure. For sure. Other panelists, Nancy, Shauna, any any thoughts or feedback? And then we are just about at time and we'll wrap it up. So Nancy, Shauna, just opportunity to, to add to the conversation. I am done. <laughs> I was just about to say the same thing. I feel pretty full, but I, I just want to thank everybody. This has been such an educational experience for me, and I'm so honored to be a part of the panel and, and to help in this conversation and um, would love to stay informed and, and involved in any way I can. So thank you and thank you to the LCB for uh opening up this dialogue we have a long way to go to resolve all these issues but i think this conversation will be very helpful going forward and so it's just been a real honor to be here with all of you today i absolutely agree i am so impressed with everybody here and how much information we've been able to share and i just wanted to let all of you know that in our message just for the panelists i'm going to give my email if any of you on the panel would like to keep in contact or anyone from the LCB for that matter. And I'm really grateful to have been a part of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I, uh, I'm gonna just take a moment and touch back to board member Howie before we wrap up here. Any, any closing words that you'd like to offer up board member Howie? Uh, thank you for putting this together, and I appreciate the way it's it's run so smoothly. Uh, capturing all these opinions and observations in one place is really, really going to be helpful to us as we sort out what we can do and uh, what we're going to have to go to the legislature for. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, maybe make some plans for that uh, unknown time in the future when we can have a unified market across the country. Um, but for right now, this is going to help us focus our efforts, bring in the necessary partners that we have to have if we're going to make some really real change and uh, move forward. Uh, it's, a, it's an important step and thank you all for taking the time. Thank you very much. So with that, um, I would just like to say again, thank Thank the panel members, John, Megan, Michael, Nancy, and Shauna for the gift of your time today and sharing your perspectives on cannabis product testing standards in Washington State. 
Elsie B., uh, thanks you uh, for that donation. We really appreciate the time and your thoughts and the robust and meaningful conversation um, that you shared with us today. I really appreciate the diversity of perspectives that was brought to um, this conversation. And um, again, we really appreciate your participation today. And likewise, thank you um, attendees for helping us navigate this first deliberative dialogue session with the LCB. I think um, for those of you who participated in our listen and learn sessions, this is quite a bit different from what we've done in the past. And so I really appreciate that everyone was willing to um, uh, listen to the guidelines, I guess is a, a fair way to say it, and um, engage in this, this conversation in a meaningful way with the, the panelists and with each other. Um, so I don't think we're gonna have time for theme review and in all honesty, um, there. There is so much material here that it's going to take us, I think, a while to harvest it. Um, so to wrap up, um, again, going back to some of the original uh, slides, the first slides that I offered here, we will um, uh, analyze the material that um, we've, we've harvested today from these great conversations, and that will be used to inform uh, rural development and policy making moving forward. And so our, our next steps are to have the, the conduct the next two panels. So our next panel is on February 4th, um, and that is a panel of um, six processors and producers um, representative of the diversity of our licensees. So we've got um, panelists representing all three tiers different types of growing indoor, outdoor, um, and those kinds of things. And then our final panel is on February 11th, and that is comprised of um, folks who work in and for labs and lab owners as well. So want to extend an invitation to um, uh, participate with us in those deliberative dialogues as well. Um, and again, questions will be um, the questions posed to the panel are those that we harvested from um, the application for each panel. Um, I want to kick it over to Audrey and Casey really quickly here. Have I forgotten anything or do you have any words that you'd like to share before we close today? This is Casey. I don't think so. Nothing that you missed. Uh, just want to express my appreciation for everyone that participated today, um, including in the chat and uh, the very robust uh, conversations that were being had. So thank you, folks. Thank you. This is Audrey. I'd add on to what Casey said, and I've, I don't think you've missed anything, Kathy. So thank you, everyone, for your participation. All right. And with that, I think we'll go ahead and end two minutes early. Again, thank you very much uh, for your participation today. And we will adjourn this session and hope to see you next Thursday, February 4th at 1.30 for our processor producer panel. Thanks, everyone, and have a really good day. Thank you, Bye. too. Appreciate it. Thanks, Kathy. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much. It was wonderful. Um, Casey, are you still there? I think I still see you. I'm still on, Kathy. I was trying oh, to save okay. some of the, the um, boxes. Are you able to okay. do that on your end? Um, I'm going to try, but I just wanted to check in with you guys before I 
signed off at the meeting to make sure the recording's all cool, no problem. Yeah, the recording is, is going and I'm gonna end it right now. Okay, um, thanks.